I wanted to share quickly the agenda today. Uh, my name is Anjali Dixon. I am with the National Center for Mobility Management, the Easter Seals Transportation Group. And I am the regional liaison for FTA regions four and seven. And I will hand it over to uh, Michelle Pronto with Florida DOT to go ahead and say a few words. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Peronto, and welcome to today's Mobility Management um, Summit that in, in collaboration with our Cutter team and the National Center for Mobility Management, um, we're going to bring to you some really great information. So a little bit about um, our District 1 area. And Anjali, I'm sorry, I'm not able to see my slides. Um, are you able to present them for me? So um, once again, thank you everybody for taking time out of your day and choosing to be here with us um, at this uh, Mobility Management Summit um, that we've crafted for you. Um, just a little bit about um, who I am and, and what I mean to you in terms of your department um, representative. Um, so I'm Michelle Peronto. I've been at the department for about 21 years. 11 of those years have been spent right here in public transportation. Um, here at the department, we're comprised of a team of nine, and we're fortunate enough to also have Cutter as an extension of our staff who are in today's setting comprised of a team of four, but there, there's probably about 15 or so Cutter employees that um, we reach out to um, on a daily and weekly basis to help us um, better perform our duties. So a few facts about District 1. We are a um, district of 12 counties. Uh, we cover about 12,000 square miles. That's a lot of miles that we have to maintain and um, get our communities up and going in terms of transportation. And um, with that, uh, we're also serving um, in a public transportation role. Um, how do we do that? With the help of our community transportation coordinators, um, which we have one that represents all 12 of our counties. We have a total of eight transit agencies, which includes um, a regional planning council. Not everyone has one of those, but we do. So we're happy to do that. And then primarily, you know, what the department expects of me and my team is to administer the funds. Well, we go well beyond that, um, or we try to go well beyond just being, you know, the, the money people for you. Um, and uh, one of those ways that we do that is to offer technical assistance like what we're doing today. In the past, you've seen us do things like driver training, pre and post check, pre and post trip, um, inspection training, grants management, other kinds of compliance, you know, helpful trainings that we've offered. So this is just another one of those trainings that we're offering to you today. Um, and we chose today's topic because of the enormous and exponential growth that we're seeing here in District 1. And how do we um, continue to provide and serve our communities with this heightened uh, need? So one of the ways that we do that um, is by having this this training, right? Just an uh, open forum for everyone to talk, everyone to get to know each other, get to know your neighbors, get to know us a little bit better, um, get to introduce you to some really great folks like Anjali over at the National Center for Mobility Management. Today, she's bringing with her a couple of experts and we're so excited um, that she's partnering with us to, to do this. Um, and also, you know, with our Cutter team. So, we can't do any of this without your partnership. So I just wanted to um, bring everyone to the table here in terms of who who is it that we partner with. Um, all eight transit agencies, and you see your logos there. I know, Scat, if you're online with us today, it's probably going to be changing soon. We're excited to see that new branding and logo. Um, and then we also uh, partner with our social service agencies um, within our 12 counties and here you see all of those agencies that we partner with and that our transit agencies partner with. So collectively they're providing um, great public transportation in our communities. And then last but not least is truly our planning partners. So where does it all begin? Um, it begins at this very base and ground level of planning for transportation. And that's what uh, these planning organizations help us do every day. Um, in terms of both public transportation um, and 
um, vehicular transportation. So um, with that, I'm going to give it over to Martin and let him start this. And then uh, we're going to hear from a bunch of other great people today. Please use your chat box, use your Q&A, you know, um, and we'll, we're happy to answer all your questions. Thanks, Martin. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, my name is Martin Catala, um, and I am the a program director at the Center for Urban Transportation Research. Uh, our group is um, happily named the Transit Management and Innovation Group. And, uh, you know, we're really, uh, you know, want to mirror the comments that Michelle made about how grateful we are to be partners, not just with FDOT and their team members, but all of the service providers in District 1. We like to try to be, it's a very gratifying experience to be supportive and helpful as uh, folks are doing sort of the, the, the angels work, right, of providing these kinds of services to your community members. And some of them are real lifeline ac activities. So we really um, find it gratifying to be able to be partners with you all. Um, today, I want to just try to give it, you know, we, we, we term this as a summit, right? It's an opportunity for us to kind of look at the, some, some pinnacle uh, examples of mobility management. And so as we kind of do the storytelling, we want to really say thank you to um, some of the partners that have brought us here today. And you'll see them as Anjali uh, Dixon from the National Center for Mobility Management. Um, she has been integral in us developing today's agenda, and we want to express our gratitude to them and the presence uh, and their, the, the partnerships that they're bringing to our conversation uh, today. So today, you know, we're, we should expect to see some evolving insights about what mobility management is. And mobility management, right, it's defined by the Federal Transit Administration. That's, that means something, right? That's not an insignificant recognition by FTA. Um, and at its heart, right, it is an innovative and customer-driven approach for managing and delivering coordinated transportation services. So today, we want to try to talk about some examples of how people are leveraging mobility management strategies and how they're developing processes and specific applications throughout the public transportation service arena. And uh, we're really uh, mindful of how these stories may not be perfect, but they may be well aligned with um, some of your situations. So they may be really insightful of like, oh, I could do something like this, or perhaps something a nuanced um, uh, version of what you're gonna be hearing today. Um, so before we kind of um, hand it off um, to the, the speakers, I also wanna give a, a, another recognition to FDOT and their, um, I think their recognition of the importance of these types of outreach activities. Um, good things don't happen unless you practice and prepare and plan for them. And we think these kinds of activities um, can help that and really want to applaud FDOT for recognizing the importance of those activities, especially among the service providers. And your, your challenge, right, isn't always uh, on a daily level innovating. And on the daily level, you're meeting the needs of your customers. So we hope these things sort of plant the seeds of opportunity uh, for new steps and new activities. Again, we want to say thank you to the National Center for Mobility Management. Uh, they've been so instructive about how we can uh, move forward with this process to help uh, communicate opportunities and educate uh, where it's appropriate. Um, and so before I, I hand it off, I, want, I do want to say one more um, recognition of the, some, of the, some of the other summit facilitators. Um, you've heard from both Michelle and myself, and you've heard a little bit from Anjali, and I know she'll introduce herself on the next, um, when I hand it off back to her and her team of uh, presenters. Um, but I also want to recognize Jonathan and uh, Rob Gregg. And Jonathan, I think you may have the ability, your microphone may be on. I just want to say a small good morning from you, and same thing for you, Rob, if you're able to. Good morning, Martin. Thank you, Rob, uh, Jonathan. And, and anything you want to add about your thoughts Looking forward to today. No, but we'll try to address uh, folks' questions as we move along in the presentations, and uh, I'll chime in with the the presenters if, uh, when possible, if there's a question that uh, per pertains directly to what they're presenting. Uh, other questions, okay. we 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 may wait till the end of the uh, the the session to to address. Great, thanks, Jonathan, and Rob. If you're able to introduce yourself. Mm 
maybe you're not in the maybe you're in a muted status. Uh, let me see. I might have to mute him, but he should be able to. Let's see. Here he goes, Rob. Rob hey, I'm here. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I just know some of yeah. the um, the partners that uh, Michelle uh, spoke about. Uh, I think you truly enjoy um, this presentation and um, some a real important follow up. Thank you, Martin. Thanks a lot, Rob. Again, thanks for everyone help uh, coordinate and put this together. Uh, and with that, Anjali, I'm just going to hand it off. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it off to you, and you'll walk us through to today's, um, I like to call it storytelling, because I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here once again, and I want to thank everyone who is on the call. Let me close this out where the participants are. I'm going to share my screen again here. So I'm going to do the presentation a little bit different. I'm actually going to, <clears throat> um, I think the previous phase one, did a presentation, it was more of a PowerPoint. This time I'm actually gonna share the resources that we have and so that you know where they are. I think that's a little more helpful and we tend to do this from time to time or we'll do both. Um, our website is the National Center for Mobility Management um, as well. Um, and I'll drop that link in the chat a little bit later so that you will have it. Um, what is mobility management? And that's what I'm talking about today. And I want you all to look at our page here. We have updated it and some time ago, but I think this kind of explains a little bit more because people tend not to, maybe not always understand what mobility management or get it confused with other terms um, in the transit world, transportation world. So it is a two part, two part thing. Um, the first part is that we wanna connect people as it says, and it's not just bus or bike, okay? I know that in many areas, Bus may be only the option, bike may be the only option. And we also are going to be updating this to add foot traffic, which is pedestrians, right? Because that is a mode. But we also have rail or some areas it may be heavy rail, maybe a light rail, maybe a trolley-like system. And we have car, um, whether that's ride share or even van pool or things like that. And then these are a lot of times the main destination where people need to go. It's healthcare, um, whether it's to school, whether it's to work, even if it's just busy socially, with um, friends and family, um, especially during COVID when people were kind of isolated um, or going to the grocery store. And then it's also a two-part thing. And so one of the things that we're gonna focus on today is the second part pretty heavily, and that is partnerships here. Mobility management really only works if you come together. So the whole, um, the old school way of thinking, two heads are better than one, three heads are better than one. Um, I like to say that for mobility management, maybe like it's like a six heads are better than one, right? The more partners, the better a lot of times. Um, and all of those partners are gonna come together as Michelle said in the beginning. Um, we have people here from transit agencies here. We have our social service partners. Um, and so a lot of those very, those variety of partners are gonna come together and that's how they're gonna make it work as far as mobility management. You're gonna manage all those modes and all those different resources to get people where they need to go. And then a lot of times we're going to either merge services, we're gonna share services, or we're gonna create a new service that's needed in the community. So that's just based on whatever the is given um, or whatever the results are from assessment that will be done in your area. So we're gonna to touch on kind of what mobility management does. Innovation is very, very big and you gotta be flexible. Um, I can come into any community and say, um, you know, you need a bus, you need uh, a bike share program, you know, you need a van pool, you know, and I can find um, a company to do it for you, but that may not be the right solution, right? May not be the right fit for you. So you have to be innovative and you have to be thinking what your community really needs and how it really connects people. But with that, once again, that, is gonna take talking to partners and then bringing them to the table. And there's another presentation that I may do sometime later that's called um, um, uh, Get on the Bus and also bringing partners to the table. Um, and it's kind of a round table discussion. And we talk about who's missing from the table and who should really be there. And that's what mobility management is, is bringing all the parties to the table to make sure that your planning um, is innovative and that it fits your community. Uh, we wanna make sure it's sustainable, okay? 
So we don't want to start a program, but we're so grateful that FTA allows more funding and gives centers like us more funding to do pilots because you can test it, right? Um, you're not putting in a ton of money at first, and then it may not be sustainable. But while you have that pilot, you may be able to pull funds from other partners from other places and making sure that that pilot that you're starting, that it is sustainable, that that service can continue for a long, long time, and that people who rely on it um, kind of just won't be stuck out at the stop or stuck out in the cold. Um, I want to make sure that customer service is first and that it's easy for them, right? It's user-friendly um, and that they can get the information anywhere. So they don't have to go and find a transportation kiosk only at the transit center, but maybe they can access that information at the social services office. Maybe they can access it at the hospital. Maybe they can access it at the grocery store or maybe they can get a pass there right? So that it's easy for them to learn. Um, we need to make sure that, and I can't see you all here, but you can see that everything is not on an app all the time. Um, technology is great. And that's a whole nother presentation we get, but we need to make sure that we are really understanding um, how our customers use our service and how they're able to access the information, right? Um, some things may still need to be posted on a paper on a map, okay? That's a really, really big deal. Um, and so that's a whole nother thing we can we can talk about later. But I just want to make sure that I put that in your mind because everybody is like, let's get this cool new app and let's do a QR code for everything. And um, believe it or not, people still have flip phones, right? Um, and I have my work iPhone. I still don't know how to use it half the time, to be honest. So it does all kinds of weird things. Um, and then we want to make sure that we have uh, good feedback and that we evaluate the service. And then we use those evaluations to um, transform, enhance, or make adjustments. Um, I am, you know, I've been in this game for like 17 years now and at a very young age running a transit service, um, which was kind of like we were flying by the seat of our pants, but we did it. And the one thing we always used to do is we heavily evaluated our student, our service, our, um, our service that we provided, right? Um, it was KU on wheels. Lawrence, Kansas didn't have a transit system. So we ran it for not only the campus, but the whole city. And, um, you know, we had buses that broke down all the time, but we made sure that we were on those buses. We had what we call kind of like secret riders ride the buses, you know, um, the public hearings, um, the surveys that we would do. And back then it was intercept surveys. Like you would literally sit on the bus stop and ask the questions. And I think that going back to the basics is a good thing because you get that true feedback by just interacting with customers and listening and hearing what they're saying or what they really want. And then, you know, we took that and we made adjustments, you know, um, listening to, you know, are the fare prices really, you know, um, fair, I guess you say for people, are they able to pay that? Things like that. So that is super important because if your customers are not happy, you're not going to have any ridership. Okay. Um, let me scroll down here and please at any time I see people in the chat, um, uh, pause or, or stop me if you have any questions, I'll pause too. Um, so well, building management professionals, what do they do? Um, I actually got a question the other day from, uh, it was KDOT from one of their people, and they said, hey, we're looking to expand and hire some more mobility management professionals, but we want some updated um, job descriptions and salaries. And so we try to collect those on our website, and I will move over from this area in just a second to show you that. But a lot of people, we get that question of what do they do? What is their key role? And so it has it spelled out right here, um, right here, plain as day, inform and connect, empathize and advocate. Um, mobility managers, they are an advocate for their community. So let me touch on this and pause right there. Your mobility manager or you as a mobility manager may be hosted in your RPC or CTD, you may call it, or um, transit agency or social service agency. And you'll see that one of our speakers is a mobility manager, but she's actually the social service agency. But she serves not only just a social service agency, she partners with a transit agency and she serves everyone. It's not just that one community. So that's really, really important. I want to emphasize that. Um, it's not just for that group of people um, here or there. It's for everybody. And she partners with the other mobility managers and the transportation planners, and some of them serve dual roles. Um, we want to make sure that they actually come together with their community stakeholders. Um, and then they actually are part of the design and the plan. Um, a lot of times we see that uh, we'll talk to mobility managers and they're like, oh, they're starting this new rail service that connects to a bike and they're starting a van pool over here. 
And I'm like, you didn't know about it? Like, where were you at? You should have been at the table when they were designing this service as soon as, before they even broke ground, making sure that all these modes connect together, making sure that the destination points are actually serving the customer or serving the constituents that you represent, okay? So we want to make sure um, that you are at the table that even before they even lay the plans on the paper, they're like asking questions. Okay, what's going on? Um, how did you evaluate this? Did you really talk to people and things like that? And this includes not necessarily cities or transit agencies, but also um, we were at the Shared Use Mobility Summit last week in Chicago. And when companies like Lime or Bird or Divi, or there's so many companies now, and they have some new ones that, um, that just launched, um, like the scooter companies are a big thing we've been hearing about and how they may just come into town and just drop off scooters and they may, you know, um, be part of some of these plans, but you need to know about that. So the minute you maybe see one, you know, you need to be um, on top of that, of what's going on, right? And not only do they have the stand-up scooters, they have the sit-down scooters that are more adaptable, especially for those that are senior and disabled. So that's very, very important, especially if you're on the social services side um, and on the transit agency side of how people may use those to connect to your paratransit or even to just your, you know, regular fixed routes. Um, and then um, after all the play and design, we want to make sure that it's launched properly and that it's sustainable once again, okay, and that it's successful. We don't want the service to start. It's great for like a year or two, maybe two years, and we're like, oh, sorry, we're going to cut the service, and it goes to major destination nodes. People can't get to work, can't get to grocery store. Um, even if you're in populations in, in Florida, there are populations that may use it for um, destinations for fun and things like that, leisure activities, but we want to make sure that it's sustained somehow. So you got to constantly be working to connect and making sure that you have stakeholders to support that. Um, and so I want to go and switch over to, just to show you here. Here's the listing of the job descriptions and competencies. At any time, uh, if anyone wants to know or they have a question of well, what do mobility managers really do? I have no idea what they do. Are they transit planners? Are they engineers? Are they, and some may be, they really, really may be. Um, you can click and we have a list and we're constantly asking for lists. We try to rotate them and then we're gonna start adding all them on there and it tells you. So I'll look, this is South Carolina. We'll go right to their page. Sometimes they just give us a PDF. It tells uh, what they do, the purpose of their position here. This one happens to be part-time and there are part-time mobility managers. Um, a lot of times they may be grad students and um, transit planning or things like that. Um, and it has their salary there, their experience and all of their duties. It says that they're an advocate here. Um, what they do specifically here is kind of uh, work with their paratransit. Um, they do the assessments. And so they collect data, compile reports, they do do the trainings and outreach that may include travel training, which you'll hear about later. So anyway, it has everything here. So if there's any ever a question, you will have a description here. Um, and sometimes you'll notice they have different titles. This is a transportation options manager. This is um, uh, a just mobility manager, okay? And so it just depends. Not all of them are gonna say mobility manager. And so I think that's really, really important that they may have different names and may serve um, in different in other roles. And this one's pretty extensive here. Um, so I just kind of want to point that out. And we're not going to look at all these, of course, you all can look at yourself, but I want to make sure because we honestly get that question a lot. We also have a whole wealth of resources here um, that you all can check out if you ever have any questions. We also have other states. I think it's always good to look at other states and see what they're doing. We have the states at the glance, and particularly, I think it's great to look at your peer states and see what they're doing. They have some pretty good partnerships going on. Um, I wanna to touch on Alabama. They have a whole partnership with their DHSS on how they do things. It's really, really great. Um, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but looking at your other states and your peer states that are next to you, I think is a really, really great thing. So you can always click on those. I know that some are constantly being updated. We also have trainings and the e-learnings here about mobility management. And it literally goes over everything. It goes over the basics, understanding what the trip is. I want to touch on to be a mobility manager and knowing what it is. You have to understand transportation, um, kind of um, at least on a base level, right? Um, and so I think it's really, really important. These are free. Um, you do get a certificate. You do have to take a little quiz. 
make sure that you know what you're talking about. So all of these, they even have them all the way from your transit agency president or CEO can take it, even to your finance people. So there are courses for everybody so that you know what mobility management is. And then most importantly, we have courses on exploring partnerships and we have a whole guide here. I wanna pause here just a second to see if there's any questions here before I get too far ahead. Anjali, I answered yes. one of the questions you did? Okay. to um, uh, the availability of the slides. So I just said that Cutter would collect and curate, and then we'll um, we'll share them out. Um, so again, want okay. to just invite anyone to if any Q and A. We'll be continuing to monitor, and I'll interrupt if there's something that I know you're kind of mid discussion, right? Okay, um, awesome. I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, I'll be. I have just about ten more minutes, and I'll try to squeeze all this in. Um, so awesome. I want to also focus on here um, that a lot of times we have grant opportunities, and I we're not the only center. Um, our other TA centers have them as well, um, but you will find them right here on our page under grant opportunities. Please, please look at those. Some of them are small grants like issue focus meetings, um, and we will be having some new ones uh, pop up here. Um, those are literally uh, where you apply for it, you fill out the application, it looks like it's actually already posted here, and they will come into the communities. I say um, they will be a team. Um, Sometimes um, it's me, but um, we are a consortium with CTAA, APTA, and Easter Seals. And so sometimes the CTA side will do those. They split up our tests um, for all of us to do, FTA does. And so um, you will fill out this application um, and they'll ask for us a little bit of um, information from you. And it allows you to bring all of those partners to the table and to bring the mobility managers to the table. And as an issue focused mobility meeting, and I think that is super, super helpful. They try to do them in the various regions. And so it really, really ties all the partners together um, from various sectors. And it really, really kind of strengthens that bond. If you were able to do that in this district, I would um, encourage you to apply. I think it's a great thing. Um, yes, we do have the summits here. It is in person. Um, and um, it talks about the eligibility here, um, that it's covered by the grant funds of bringing people together. Um, there's usually a lunch and things like that. Um, Bill Wagner is the contact for this. But I do wanna encourage you to check that out. So I think Michelle would probably be the one to, to fill that out most likely. Um, and so these are some of the meeting topics. Um, I know down in Mississippi, we did one last year and their um, topic was that they wanted to coordinate with um, their various social service agencies to do just one, one call, one click kind of resource where people can get information. Because once we got everyone in the room, we found out there was three of them. And then they'd be like, oh, they call for transportation. We pass them here and pass them there. So um, they actually had a webinar not long ago, but they were establishing one um, area where people can get information. So it's so much easier for the customer to access. So um, these are some of the topics and there's a lot of other ones. Um, I believe there's an area we'll ask you kind of what the topic is. And if you all need any assistance to kind of brainstorm about that, please let me know if you're interested. Um, it does have um, past meetings and it looks like those haven't all been posted yet. Um, there's one from 2020 that was posted as you see of the various um, places where they had the issue focus meeting. So you can check those out. So please check that out. I think that would be a great thing for Florida as you all continue to um, you know, try to learn about partnerships and develop your mobility management. Um, of course, we have external funding opportunities and you're probably wondering, well, why is she going over that? Because this is part of the mobility manager's job. Um, you will look at these opportunities and you will look at ways to manage all your modes. And that's uh, looking at also the funding to help support and sustain these. So that's why I'm actually going over all of these. And so as you see, there are other types of funding opportunities that tie in. And Danielle Nelson will be here from FTA later talking about the federal funding rate and how you can tie different types of funds together. So there's a whole list here, but that is one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up. Um, a lot of times mobility managers also double as grant writers or they work with the grant writers to make sure that they're bringing in funds to help support these various modes and various types of um, new modes that will be coming in. The next thing I just wanna point out is that we, um, if you go and click the FTA site, click on CCAM and Danielle will touch more on that later on. Um, CCAM is the Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility. If you're a mobility manager, you should know everything about this. I encourage you to take a couple of days and read over it. Um, if you can, you can look at the shortcut version here um, and learn all about CCAM, who, um, how it started, who the partners were, 
and um, who new partners are that came on across various agencies. Um, it may seem a little um, kind of overwhelming because you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much at a federal level, but all those partners trickle down to the regional level, state level, and then the local level, right? So maybe DHSS, but all of them have local offices that you can partner with, right? Or USDA, they have local offices. Um, so it all trickles down to the local level where everyone is managing a mode. And so um, they have the same problems that you do um, of basically how to get people to their resources and to places and to their services and centers and things like that. So that's why it's very, very important for everyone to come together and then try to manage all of the modes to get people where they're supposed to go. Um, it talks about incidental use. Uh, mobility managers get the phone call all the time is, uh, can I, can we use our vehicle to take people to go get food or can we bring food to them and, and such? Um, and so this kind of explains um, how you can use your transit vehicle. Um, and we know that it can interfere with the actual service. So if someone needs to get to doctor's appointments, I can't go do food deliveries during that time, basically. So, um, and there's more information on here. It's, a, it's also um, in the circular as well. So um, this has a list of CCAM partners, incidental uses, um, and some of the programs that were done. And we are actually working on expanding this list. So there's a whole lot of information here. If you're a mobility manager, your area may be in here. You may learn from other areas. So I encourage you, um, as part of your job task to review this table and continue to review this table. Also, um, their contact information is in here. Um, don't be shy and reach out. Um, if you're also a CEO or um, a manager or anything at any of the transit agencies, they're listed on here too. Reach out to them and see how they're doing things. Um, it never hurts to ask um, and learn about another program. And then pass that down to your mobility managers or if you double as that as a mobility manager. All right, just a few more minutes here. Let me move over here. Um, if you're looking for anything or any TA, I just wanna uh, always throw this out here. We continue to pro provide TA to every region. Um, I uh, will provide TA to your region. So um, please check us out. Please follow us. Uh, we have newsletters, we have blog posts, we have the um, MMC platform. Um, just shoot me an email, call me directly if you have to, not a problem. Um, I pretty much answer my phone and my email all the time. Uh, we do travels a lot of times in the spring and summer as we're giving trainings. Also, if you need to find us or just click on the who we are, it has uh, more information about NCMM, what mobility management is, and then it has all of our staff, it has all of our regions, not to say that we can't cross regions. Um, my phone number is right here, it's not hidden, so you can just copy and paste and call me, um, or you can click on my name right here and it shoots me an email, okay? Um, I will try to get back to you usually within the day or so, um, but please do not hesitate. And if it's something, that maybe I may not know about, I will look at one of my colleagues and say, hey, they may have experience in that or they're doing this in this area or they have a mobility manager that's came across that. Um, and then I will make sure that we get you the information. So I just wanna put that out there. Um, please always ask questions about your role as a mobility manager because mobility managers, as we see, um, the role has changed. Um, and I just kind of want to leave you with this quick kind of story. Um, we know that what's it been about two months or so now that um, in Mississippi, they had tornadoes hit. My mobility managers, their whole world changed. Um, they went from having to connect people to transportation options, um, getting them doctor's appointments, um, running a fixed route um, uh, program, all the way to, okay, now we got to collect items. We have to fill our buses and vans um, to take goods to um, our different communities that were hit. Um, and also they had to spend time trying to locate people. And especially they're a social service agency, like we can't find some of the people that normally come to our office to appointments or they had doctor's appointment schedules um, and things like that. So you all are in areas that we call a lot of times um, uh, emergency zones or disaster areas um, in Florida. And even if they're inland, doesn't matter now, um, tornadoes and things are hitting everywhere, they normally didn't. And so we wanna make sure that um, if that does happen, that you can pretty much snap your fingers and connect with those partners and um, your role will change very, very quickly. 
um, and that you can do what you need to do as a mobility manager. So, you know, the question that that will be asked is, what is a mobility manager? It is a lot of things. You are a, um, really, I like to say, you are a transit planner. You are um, a manager of modes. You are a social worker. Um, you can be a designer and you can be a grant writer, if I would just say the top five things. And I know that may seem like a lot. You may say, well, that wasn't in my job description. But somewhere in there, if you read your description, it is. So just think about that. Um, and that, that is the role that you take on as you're representing your agency, your communities. I see a laughing face there, but you really are. And that's just the world that we live in. Um, and I, even up here at this level, um, am a mobility manager. But I'm a mobility manager for like 25 states a lot of times, right? The DOT doesn't hire me, but I am. So when something happens, disaster strikes, I get the phone calls too. I see all this stuff. If it's a Saturday, I think that happened. I was on my phone at a baseball game, making sure everyone was okay in those different states and sending messages and what, is, what do people need? And so even where I'm at, it's the same thing because you're building relationships and it's almost like, um, I have a slide that's called the transportation family tree, like you're all a big family um, and it's really, really important. So I just kind of, I wanna leave you all with that. Are there any questions? Good job, Anjali. I was going to say that, you know, when you pointed to um, your phone number and email, that's how I found you. Yeah. Uh, I went to the center and I said, let me just, oh, let me just see if I email. And, you know, the truth is the number of times I've emailed people that have their emails on websites and you don't hear from them is countless. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard back from you within 24 hours and we had a first meeting within the, you know, week after my reaching out to you. So uh, I just want to encourage folks that they are a good resource and they're available, so. <laughs> we have, uh, Mark, are you gonna, there you go. And next we have Kelly Ast, who's the Regional Mobility Manager at West uh, Missouri Central Community Action Agency. Did I say that right, Kelly? I might've got tongue tied. <laughs> She's also with it's a long growth. title. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> She's also with New Growth Transit and New Growth, um, which is a new nonprofit that they've started out. And I'll let her talk a little bit more so I don't give it away. Um, and she will be presenting on building partnerships um, to transportation and mobility. And she is from Nevada, Missouri. Yes. You can share your screen there. Oh, I can share my screen. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Thank you. I couldn't say enough um, just to follow up with what Anjali is saying in regards to wearing multiple hats as a mobility manager. But I think that's the advantage that we have is that we can really help these communities. There we go. And so our project, we're looking at redefining rural transportation. In the state of Missouri, we rank 50th in regards to receiving funding for mobility and transportation. So we um, collectively worked with a very grassroots effort and um, to create more access and more opportunities um, because we have so many communities in our rural areas in West Central Missouri that are just their residents are living in complete isolation. So um, let me explain our organization. So I'm a mobility manager, but I don't uh, work with a transit authority. Um, I, I actually work uh, in an organization, a community action organization. And so there's community action all across the United States. And so we help people in communities reach their full potential um, by cultivating, coordinating resources, building partnerships and advocating for change. So what this means is that we uh, work with families in um, job recruitment, um, employment and training programs. We assist families with their utilities. We work with senior adults and we also are the public housing authority and four of our nine counties. And um, our counties are here in the uh, navy blue. Those are our core counties. 
And then um, we have other programs that go outside of our core um, and like transportation, we've already picked up. Um, so we're, we are currently running our network in 10 counties. And um, so we also have a community development corporation inside the parent company of the agency. And so for that's how we work our transportation model. And that's how we engage our community stakeholders. And so the mission for that organization is that um, we are an affiliate and we're strengthening rural communities by connecting, cultivating, and catalyzing rural assets and entrepreneurs. And I can't say enough about transportation um, because it is definitely about connecting, cultivating relationships, um, cultivating resources for sustainability, and then catalyzing innovation because we've got to start thinking differently. And what's great is that we have technology now and we have so many more opportunities to think broader about transportation. And so when we started our model, like I said, we had we had very few resources. Um, we only had three counties that even had public transportation, and they primarily just ran during the week. Um, and, and all of those would start as late as 830 in the morning and would run till about 430. So we didn't have a lot of resources. We had a, we did have a bus service, a fixed route bus service that was available in a lot of the major cities in our counties, but we didn't have anybody that was running throughout the whole region consistently seven days a week. And so what we did was we were uh, granted by HRSA, Health Resources and Service Administration of America, to create a strategic plan. And that strategic plan was going to look at resources um, that did exist, gaps of resources, and then help us to find stakeholders and build relationships in the region that would address the need for more transportation. And so I can say that we collectively finished that during the pandemic. Um, we finished our strategic plan and we had 40 regional partners. And what's exciting is that we had a lot of diversity in those partners. We had medical providers, employers, schools, county commissions. And when we started that strategic plan, in the second meeting, we were primarily bringing non-emergency medical transit like providers to the table. Then we were bringing medical providers, and it was it was our stakeholders that came to us and said, "Why don't you have employers? Why don't you have schools?" You know, they were the ones that understood everybody needs to be at the table for transportation. So then in 2020 to 2021, we used CARES funding along with CSVG community block grant support, and we launched a volunteer transportation network. In that, that original plan from HRSA, the, collectively all the community stakeholders said, we think a volunteer transportation network would help bring more resources. Then we turned around in 2021 and we received private funding from Patterson Family Foundation. Uh, it was a regional funder who had never ever funded anything in transportation, but what we pitched to them was that this was about people getting healthy access to food and resources in their communities, and then we, we kind of threaded together the opportunity to build some sort of technology to support rural transportation, um, and the Volunteer Transportation Center is a microtransit on-demand model, and so we kind of coined it as like an Uber uh, a rural Uber lift, but the innovation to that private funder was an opportunity to build something that they could replicate and they could take to other communities. And then currently we also have a state appropriations. And so we're excited about this support um, and that funding helped us expand phase two of our volunteer transportation network. And so as we begin, I think what's important is when you're working with communities um, and you're starting to build the relationships and stakeholders, and you're starting to build an understanding of where communities are in transportation. You know, we assumed everybody knew the challenges. And in those early strategic planning meetings, we, we realized very quickly that people knew we didn't have enough transportation resources, but they really didn't know the challenges that people faced. And so we looked to regional community needs assessments, we did surveys with United Way. Um, we also did surveys with 
with uh, really any nonprofit, a couple community foundations in the area. And these were some of the research that we found that some people had a lack of funds for maintaining vehicles, like they might have owned a vehicle, but they were struggling with the repairs. There was a, just a general lack of education about purchasing, insuring, and maintaining a vehicle. Um, there was, of course, we knew there was a lack of public transportation options. Um, and we also knew that it was not always available when it was needed. And so that led to additional research. And we started looking at, we, we leaned on our employers. And what we found is that our employers were able to share with us like their shifts times, you know, seven to three. And so we saw a lot of public transit services that were available 830 to three. So they were missing and they were not able to be there for their staff that either had, you know, temporary challenges with getting to work or they had permanent challenges with working. working. And so we started talking to the public transportation providers that were in the area about rotating shifts or getting drivers available um, for some of those communities that, that have a lot of shifts, that's the main employer in the area. And then we also saw that there was limited transportation for medical appointments, which we knew, um, but then we also started to dive into that and, you know, we started seeing that it was affecting employment, like I said earlier, with the limited schedule, um, childcare. You know, we were we uh, very quickly started hearing from school districts that had different preschool programs or their bus routes were at limited capacity and they needed to serve additional families. And then we really started hearing about the need for just access to grocery stores. Um, so I think this is a great way that when we're building relationships in the community to create more transportation resources, we really have to know who we are serving. And, you know, those top three bullets, lack of funds, you know, or people lack of education about how to purchase and maintain a vehicle, those really created a lot of dialogue with the stakeholders who fortunately had been able to afford vehicles or had always driven and hadn't faced these challenges. So I can't say enough, as you build your transportation program, and as you continue to adapt it to the need, always understand who you're serving. And so then we needed to look at the transportation infrastructure. We now knew who, and so what were we really up against? What were we, what did we have? What were our assets and where were our gaps? And in that, that's when we, you know, there was little to no ADA accessibility accessible van options that were across any of our counties. And then additionally, we noticed that if there were fixed routes, that they were scattered. Um, and so that also that there were no bus stops that were existent. So there might have been a route in a community, but there was no bus stops that would shelter people from the elements or that were ADA accessible, or there were no bus stops that had you know, uh, that were, would be lit. Um, so we then reached out to a uh, community. That's when we started engaging communities, um, stakeholders like mayors, councils, um, county commissions. So if we were to do a fixed route, who would want to pay for the maintenance and who would want to install bus routes? And very quickly, we didn't get a lot of people that stepped up to the plate. So then that's when that eliminated adding additional fixed route to our transportation improvements. And then another thing is that there were so many lack of complete streets. We found a lot of dirt paths um, to and from Dollar General's. Um, we found a lot of streets that didn't have curb and guttering and that definitely weren't ADA accessible. And so um, looking at, again, who we served and what that infrastructure looked like uh, lend us the opportunities to start addressing those gaps and put together a network. So we all, so then we started breaking down as we looked at those partners that we had engaged we started looking at what we call the transportation value chain. And so this is looking at everything from our supply and our support partners. So we are, we saw ourselves as the coordinators here in the beginning. And so as mobility managers, we're the coordinators, again, for the innovations, we're the coordinators on funding, we're the coordinators on building relationships. And so we started looking at who was in the region that was supplying transportation. And we had some public transit providers we found some uh, private service agencies, but then, of course, we were wanting to bring the 
um, opportunity of a volunteer transportation network. Then we started breaking down who are our support. So our supply chain is here. We stand as the coordinators, then who's our support? So we looked to community funders. We started doing a lot of, inf of updates about the network, about our research with community funders, even if they were a small group, even if it was a retired teachers or it was a women's sorority, we got in front of everybody, um, anybody that could potentially be a community funder. Then we looked again to local city governments, um, local county governments. And what we found was that the research we shared about who we were serving and some of the gaps that existed, we found we got a very positive response. Then we looked again to what transportation agencies existed in the area to share the research and look for opportunities that we could collaborate, you know, look for opportunities that maybe they were struggling in certain areas that might have been our strengths. And so we definitely opened a lot of doors. We started networking. That's when I met Anjali. Um, also, she was very easy to get a hold of. I, I started listening to all the webinars, but we started just working that network throughout the state. And then we started understanding that there was a severe demand for the non-emergency medical. And so we started going to all of our hospitals, our regional clinics. Um, and this was an opportunity to hear about how there were a, a diversity of need, you know, days and times when they needed transportation um, and, and what types of transportation that they needed to prioritize. And then we look over here to our demand partners. If we're going to coordinate a volunteer transportation network, we had to look at our demand, like who would be utilizing that service and who could potentially support this idea. And that's when we found senior centers, social service agencies, um, employers, education, and we, of course, was back at the hospitals and clinics. And so this I can say like in our demand partners here, while some of these demand partners were also um, individuals who needed service, they also were individuals who came around and then demanded to be a part of the network. So while we served them, they also ended up being some contractual partnerships with us that pay for some of our rides. So I think when you're breaking down and you're building this network, really understanding that value chain and where you fit in it and those partners, but demand are not only people who can use your service, but can also help pay for your service eventually. So then we started to break it down with even more support. We started, um, we received a grant where we could do some assessments in the region. And this again is how we continue to build that relationship with our community stakeholders. We kept building awareness of what really is the challenges with transportation. And so we looked at these two maps here and these are our region. And these maps are what we presented on, you know, any press releases we had. We did this at community events. I had one pagers with me all the time. We would go to communities and we don't have internet um, throughout all of rural Missouri. And so I had to always have a backup. Um, couldn't always have a PowerPoint presentation. So I always had a one pager um, that contained these two maps. And so these maps seem to really engage people and understand those challenges again. And so what shows you here is that the dark areas on the left are areas of density where we see senior adults. So the darker that they are, there's more senior adults that live in those regions. And then we overlaid it with medical resources. So the H is a hospital and the plus sign is a clinic. And if you look over here on the left side of the map that's purple, you see all of these medical facilities. Well, that's a much younger population than we see over here on the right, where we see density of older adults. And so we were able to illustrate to people that there was a disconnect. And transportation is about connecting. And so over here on the right with the orange map and the blue circles, we then also understood that employment transportation was not really being assessed properly. And we saw that as an opportunity with the volunteer transportation network. So we were able again to look at these areas of orange are the darker orange it is, those show pockets of higher unemployment. And then the blue circles are small and large employers. 
And so we were able to see a gap where, for instance, in the bottom left, where it says Fort Scott, Nevada here, this is Vernon County. And so this is a county where you see lots of darker orange, which are pockets of unemployment that tend to be residents that are further out and more isolated in the county. And then we saw more consensus of small and large employment, but we could see the distance between those households that uh, with unemployed residents and then we had a, a really good center of, of employment. And so that again shows us a gap and an opportunity to provide transportation to those employers that are managing multiple shifts within a day. And so, like I said, these two um, maps, we use those we use those throughout all of our counties to bring more understanding and to show that we were looking at transportation resources and we were pinpointing specific need. So what we created was um, what we what we like to call a thriving transportation ecosystem. This is what we feel like all of our communities need to aspire to. And you'll see on the left here, we a lot of people do have you know some microtransit. They've got taxi services, or we have the large passenger vans. But in addition, we want our communities to consider and start to become more educated and start to support and sustain a volunteer transportation network on the right and to eventually look at van pool options. Um, like I said, we live in rural Missouri. We're very, we have a lot of distance between our communities, but we don't see much van pool or carpooling that is currently active. And so, um, I can successfully say that, man, it's been six years of a lot of training, a lot of um, acquiring of volunteers, and we have a successful volunteer network. Um, we have found partnerships all across the region um, throughout West Central Missouri. We've also seen uh, partnerships throughout the Midwest and even throughout the nation um, to help us support a uh, volunteer transportation center out of New York State. They are our cooperative partner. They're helping us build a model. Um, we're seeing a lot of success. Uh, we are actively providing rides every day in 10 counties. Um, but when we look at the progress of the partnerships, um, I want to point out on this side that the network still to this day remains both publicly and privately funded. And I think that that is very important because um, we will hopefully always have the opportunity to, to to apply and be awarded grant funding, but having that private investment in our model as we develop, that is, that is our communities having a stake in the development of this model. And I think that's why we were successful. We do not have a marketing budget with our volunteer transportation network. It is all word of mouth. It's all grassroots. Um, a lot of our recruitment is all it's community based. I mean, we're asking volunteers um, that are reimbursed 65 and a half cents a mile to use their vehicles to provide transportation. So this is very much a community based approach and having that private funding will continue to allow us to expand in technology, allow us to get the tools our drivers need, such as first aid kits magnetic signs, you know, afford some of those luxuries that help our model um, become more robust. And also, I think private funders, you know, your reporting looks a little different with private funders. Um, it's not just outcome based, you add testimonials to that funding, and you really build up those communities to have investment in transportation. One thing we saw when we first started this model and started building partnerships is that a lot of people said, well, there's a FTA grant out there for that, isn't there? They didn't even know that they could, you know, create these pots of funding, get this started to help build a baseline to help us apply and have better results to be more competitive in those grants out there. And so um, we go back every year and we keep asking for that investment and we bring data, um, we bring information, we bring testimonials, we build what we call a 
provider profile and we break it down per each county and we show the difference in who we're serving in each county throughout our whole region. So for instance, in one county, um, we do more employment transportation. And in another county, we do more transportation for food and for medical. And so I just think that's interesting because you know they're neighboring counties, but the needs are so different based upon the ages of the residents um, and just a lot of times the geography of those counties too. And so I also wanna point out that this diverse group of community stakeholders keeps growing. Um, just this last week, I was able to talk to a ministerial alliance. Um, you know, so it's a lot of our pastors and priests that uh, represent these counties. Um, they work in a lot of nonprofits. They also um, understand grassroots. So they and they are open to giving us referrals. And that's always if if a, if a faith leader can give a referral to your network, um, it seems like people are they're interested and they listen. Um, additionally, we work with employers. Um, they reach out to us. We uh, try to coordinate temporary service. Um, we also work with our employers, you know, when they have events and fairs throughout their um, their facility, we ask that we can be on that list. We come to any sort, we've been to everything from an energy fair to an employee appreciation picnic, but we try to have a booth there. Um, we, we tend to give away a lot of uh, air fresheners for your car with our logo and our phone number on them. But again, we're just trying to get out there, recruit volunteer and talk about um, carpooling and van pooling options. We go to all of our senior center facilities. We've eaten a lot of fried chicken, <laughs> um, but we, we never miss a senior center event. We have some sort of staff that goes there. And, you know, we always learn about, you know, what transportation um, challenges they have. We see funding change. Um, so I can't say enough being connected with those demand partners. You know, maybe when you first start talking to them, they don't need your services, but then funding changes and all of a sudden a service is suspended and you wouldn't have known about it unless you were there at that event and you can look at those individuals and hear their challenges one on one. When we work with behavioral health practitioners, um, we're starting to see that um, towards the end of COVID, there was a lot of telehealth um, opportunities, um, but now they're wanting to see patients more in person. Um, so we work very close with our behavioral health practitioners, um, try to get people transported for um, you know, patient therapy. And, and so they've been a great resource. Also, they identify areas that are underserved and in extreme amounts of isolation. We also work with our dental clinics. And so dental clinics throughout the area, um, they are, they're spread throughout our area and they serve, um, they, they bring in customers, um, or I should say patients. Um, so we're constantly looking at, at, they have some mobile clinics. So if they're in I need to say this better, but if they're in an area in a mobile clinic, we transport um, individuals to those areas, but they also go to those areas that are extremely isolated and they refer our service and they, they refer to our mobility management. And so that's kind of how that uh, relationship has grown. Schools, community colleges, we're constantly working with families. We're constantly working, um, trying to figure out ways to get families to support their children's IEP. Um, and then we, like I said, rural hospitals have always been at the table with us. And then um, our economic developers in the areas and our regional planning commission, they help us with funding. Um, you know, understanding there's a lot of different avenues of funding that are available. And sometimes it can seem cumbersome trying to figure out when you need to apply or, or what letters of support you need. So I can't say enough that those relationships with your local economic developers, they help you build relationships with employers. Um, and then additionally, they, they can help you sustain your model and what you're trying to build with uh, funding potential. And so uh, before I, I close today, I think it's just really important. Um, we're very proud of another stakeholder that we have in our model, and that's our volunteers. 
We couldn't, we couldn't do this without them. And I always, every time I speak to a community, I try to humanize transportation. We know it's a challenge, um, but not all of us access public transportation every day. And this is one of our superstars that helps us bring more opportunities in rural Missouri. And this is Thelma. Thelma's a retired RN. Um, she lives in Cedar County and she prefers uh, to drive locally throughout her county, but then she also travels two counties away to some major medical facilities and some uh, large box stores where she takes residents uh, to buy in bulk in addition to non-emergency medical. She averages 15 trips a week. Some of those trips can be as long as 200 miles round trip. Um, and she just joined us in fall of this year, but she talks so much about purpose and it wasn't until she herself had become a senior adult that she realized how, how many people that she knew had limited to no access to their communities or any resources in a metropolitan area. And so she feels like she's able to drive. And um, we just really appreciate, like I said, um, Velma, she's a volunteer driver, but she's definitely a part of our stakeholder and our partnerships. Um, that we're putting together in West Central Missouri to build an improved framework for transportation. And then I would like to show you our um, partner slide. And I mentioned this earlier, our partnerships are public and private investment partners. So we work with Replica on our data sourcing. We work with On My Own. It's a regional independent living organization. We have county commissions, Verizon, they're a great supporter of the tablets we purchase for our volunteer drivers. We've got Dallas County. Um, Dallas County Commission and the Community Foundation have a great story. We didn't have funding to go into that community, but between a local bank, the commissioners, and the Community Foundation, they were able to fund the rides, and we were able to provide a match of ride coordination services. This was completed in six months. It took us two months to put a program out there and we're doing a little over 5,000 miles a month for a very small county in Missouri. So that's a great story about a private investment that is then matched with public investment and we hope to get them funded for the next three years. Of course, Patterson Family Foundation, they've been wonderful. Another private organization that funded our expansion and technology development. Um, as well as our recruitment and certification processes that we needed for our volunteer drivers. Commute Enterprise, we work with them to promote van pooling. It's been another great opportunity to work with a large or transportation organization throughout the state um, and just understand their processes. Another private uh, trust, Moss Care Connection, that's the management company of all of our senior centers. Kaysinger is our Regional Planning Commission, and then of course, Volunteer Transportation Center of New York State. They are our collaborative partner. So on this slide of public-private investment, these partnerships you guys can see local, regional, statewide, and nationwide support. So at this time, um, I would open uh, for questions. If anybody has any questions? Kelly, Good morning, this, this is, is uh, Kelly. Oh, there we're we'll talking. Go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Kelly. It's Jonathan with Cutter. But there were two. Um, uh, there are now three questions. Um, one of them, the first one, was related to the 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 role of employers, big employers, and I think you demonstrated that uh, quite a bit toward the end of the presentation. Is there anything else you would add about employment, uh, major employers, even smaller employers, assisting? Uh, uh, with your program? Oh, definitely. Um, I think that they help develop that framework because a lot of times when we're transportation providers, you know, the providers look at what works best for their employee schedules. And you bring to the table having that relationship with both large and small employers, you bring the information about when they have shift change. Another thing with some of our small employers, um, we're agriculture based here. So we have a lot of seasonal employment. And so um, we kind of tend to mediate and be that voice for the, the transit providers or the grants that are out there, you know, be that voice for those employers. They're busy running their businesses, but when their employees can't get to work, um, it really sets them back. So I can't say enough. Yeah, 
your your relationship with the large corporate sponsors and your small employers is important. Great. Um, uh, appreciate that. A, a second question from Heidi um, is related to the geography. Uh, what happens if there's challenges or trips across um, state lines, but maybe also um, the surrounding counties uh, that are that are out of your uh, your commissions, your your organization's region. I think everybody can relate to at least you know there's a hard border probably for everybody, and so how you might deal with this. Yeah, so all of our funding is set up to where we can transport people inside our county, inside our territory, we can transport them out. Now okay. we don't transport people outside in. Um, so that's because you're exactly right. I mean, we were 20 miles from the Kansas border. You know, we have an FQHC that offers mental, a uh, federally qualified health center that offers mental health services for youth and for adults. So we have a lot of people that we transport to those necessary services. So all of our funding is set up um, and we negotiate that with those funders up front. Great. Good to know. Uh, one last question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can you tell us more about Replica, uh, what it does and how much does it cost? Yeah, Replica has been a great resource for us. Again, um, it's before we were, we had a network where we were, um, we had data that we could pull based upon where people are going, what time people are going and who we're transporting. Um, we needed to show the demand. And those were those two um those were those two maps that I showed you. And so Replica was a tool that we could get information about from people's cell phone, you know, stoplight data. We could start to build, um, we called it mobility audits per county. So we could start to show people peak times. And Replica was the only tool that we could find out there that had information, even on some of our smallest counties, where the whole population of the county might only be thousand people. And so it's been a great relationship. We've used them for the last year. They've taught us a lot about aggregate data. Um, with the subscription comes um, a, like an analyst um, who sometimes I can't get into that tool and find what I need, but they can cut and splice it and they can show us. Um, Cause like I said, it's very heavy in data and results. And so what's important out of this is that um, they can help us create and bring the information that we need back to those stakeholders. And I will say it's not cheap. <laughs> Um, but we felt like it was a good investment in the first year to tell our story and so um, to help build additional funding and awareness of the transportation challenges. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, that was it on the questions for, for Kelly, Anjali. Okay, next we have is Michelle Griffin. She's a mobility manager with the state of Kansas. Oh, I see some more hand claps for Kelly. And <laughs> I want to drop that there. So um, Kelly, can, I, you can share Michelle. Let's make sure you can share here. Okay, and as I stated earlier, she gives an awesome presentation on um, partnerships as well. And as I stated, you know, two heads are better than one, but hers is called six heads is better than one, which is where I got that from. So I'll let Michelle take it away. All right, hold on one second. Of course, my technology is being difficult. It's wanting to jump over to my other screen. So we'll just switch it. There we go. Can you see it? All right. So thanks, Anjali. Thanks, everybody, for having me um, here today. I'm Michelle Griffin. I am a mobility manager based in north central Kansas. And I'm going to talk through some of the things that we do uh, as the group. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am based in North Central Kansas, so I'm pretty much in the center of the state, and I have eight counties that I work with. 
um, that go north to the Nebraska border. I've been in public transit since 2016, and I was actually the first full-time mobility manager in the state. And I don't know uh, about you guys, but starting this program, uh, I remember going into my interview and kind of looking around the room, it was full of people. And I said, what is a mobility manager? And it was kind of silent for a minute. And then a lot of awkward giggling. Uh, and they kind of looked at each other and said, we don't really know. Um, so we've been working on building our network and building the program and developing mobility management kind of since that very first day. I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of really great projects over the years. Uh, we started 81 Connection, which is a regional fixed route that serves between Salina, where I am, and goes all the way north, um, almost to Nebraska. We started Kansas Rides website, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We started CanCycle, which is a kind of unique, one-of-a-kind program for regional bike sharing. So we have 80 bikes spread across eight communities here in North Central Kansas. Most of them are very small, very rural. Um, and we're fortunate that we were able to provide bike sharing to them that they maybe wouldn't be able to do on their own. We borrowed from Florida and started Kansas Mobility Week, and I'll talk about that, as well as our Moving Kansas Network. So a little bit about transit in Kansas. So we have about 140-ish agencies all across the state. We have 105 counties. Uh, we have about 800 vehicles, and those agencies provide about 10 million rides annually. A big chunk of those are urban, but we do do about two and a half million rides rural. We think that transit service is relatively new across our state. For example, the fixed route system here in the town that I'm in, Salina, started in 2008. So that's relatively new. And not all of our counties have transit service. So we are trying to work together to figure out how we can serve every Kansan. Uh, a little bit better than we are right now. So we need to continue to evolve and grow and just be a little bit better. So here's a map of our state. Um, so you can see each of the counties is in its in um, is organized into a coordinated transit district. KDOT, Kansas Department of Transportation, does that so that they are easily able to uh, send funds to agencies. So I am the gold star. I did not pick these colors, um, but I am in North Central Kansas. And then we've got five other mobility managers across the state, also with the, the different stars, and I'll run through our team here in a minute. But you can see that although we do have six mobility managers on our team, uh, we do have a, a wide section of the state that is not covered by mobility management. The ultimate goal would be, of course, to have at least one mobility manager in each of these CTDs, so we would have coverage across the state. So mobility management was kind of thought up and brought about in 2014 when KDOT released this um, business model plan, and they had done um, statewide group meetings, worked with a consulting firm to develop this plan. And so in my area, mobility management was the top goal. Um, each of the mobility managers are structured a little bit differently. So we each have a host agency. And sometimes this gets a little bit confusing for people when we try to explain who we are and what we do. I have a host agency. They act as my fiscal agent. I have an office here in their building. I'm treated as an employee, but I'm not their employee. So I'm, I'm separate. I kind of hang out here on my own. Each of the other mobility managers are exactly the same way. We get to share in the benefits of our host agency. None of us have our own employees and supervision of our positions really differs across the board, depending on what area you're in. We do report to both our CTDs and to KDOT. Um, I'm very rural. Uh, a couple of the other mobility managers are in urban settings, so it really just varies on um, what kind of passengers we're looking at or talking to and different things that we're working on. We each have to come up with our own budget, working with our host agency, and how that's funded also varies. Um, some host agencies pay the full amount. 
other CTDs kind of join in together to come up with that local match. Um, just lots of differences between each of us. One thing that we do have consistent though is our branding. So we are all under Kansas Mobility Management and we've got the blue and gold that uh, replicates the Kansas logos as well. So what do we do every day? Well, the standard answer for that is it, it depends. So like I mentioned, each of the CTDs is different in the structure, the makeup, uh, the number of agencies, whether they're 5310, 5311, 5307, really is just varied across the state. Each of the mobility managers are very different. I'll talk about that in a minute. We have very different backgrounds and different interests. The agencies that we work with are different. They have different needs, different wants, different goals. The same with our regional goals. So basically, at the end of the day, no two days are ever the same. We work on a lot of different projects uh, in a lot of different ways. We've tried to provide some guidance to new mobility managers coming on. So we've established a Kansas Mobility Managers Handbook. And it kind of takes all of the things that each of us learned in our first couple years, combine that into one place to give someone coming in brand new, a little bit of a guide to say, hey, these are some things that we think are important that you might wanna think about as you're getting started. It's not hard and fast rules, but it's just suggestions on things that you can do. So I mentioned there are six of us. So of course I've been around the longest. Um, some of the things that I work on the most or are my interests are project management, planning, organization, marketing, graphic design, networking, websites, and um, being multimodal. Mike Wilson came on in 2018. He is our tech guy. So he likes apps, cameras, equipment, digital signage, real-time GTFS, anything like that. We've got Mike Spadafor, uh, came on in 2019, and he had previously worked for the Department of Transportation, so he is very much into rules. So you can ask him any question about funding, policies. He works with a lot of 5310s. He also is very good at nationwide connections and he likes to write grants. Jessica came on in 2021. She has a social work background. And so she's really been focusing on building relationships and hosting community events. And last but not least, Dre came on in 2022. He has a planning background. So he um, is very good with mapping, GIS. He is working on building a volunteer driver program also relationship building and consensus building. And the very newest is Cassandra, who came on later in 2022. She is very skilled with disability accommodations, service animals, um, has a background in civil service, and is also working on making connections. So you can see we cover a wide And then, right, and then uh, also helping to plan and develop projects and services. So helping agencies with project facilitation. We are a big community resource. So we're kind of considered transit experts. Um, I work for an agency or within an agency that serves 14 counties. And so I can kind of be that go-to person for, we need a ride that maybe falls a little bit outside of the the guidelines or the counties, what can you help us with? And then we really do work on connecting people. Um, so I try to talk to as many people as I can, pass out a ton of business cards, try to make connections, because like has been talked about already, um, it's communication and connections that make transit do what it needs to do. So some of the specific Topics or projects that I will talk about today for Kansas Mobility Management is, of course, Kansas Rides, some shared platforms, a little on Kansas Mobility Week and Bike Month, 
National Transportation Week, our Moving Kansas Network, KCART, our Kansas Tech Summit, and some other things. So I did mention that we have Kansas Rides, which is our statewide transportation resource website. Uh, before I came on, we didn't have a, a one-stop shop. Um, each of the agencies had their own website if they had a website at all. So it was very difficult to find information about transportation across the state and especially in those rural counties and rural communities. So we developed this website. It's organized by county. You can find a ride um, through the different agencies that are in those counties. We share news and events. And we've also added information about bikes and scooters. So we're including multimodal options. It's kind of basic information right now. And one of our goals in the future working with KDOT is how we can turn this into a statewide trip planner that anyone can use. There are some models that exist already. Govermon is a great example of that. And so that's where we're hoping to take our website. We also have a Facebook page for Kansas Rides and the mobility managers take turns posting information, stories, events, anything that we feel is uh, good information for both passengers and agencies to have. By building our mobility manager network in Kansas, we've been able to have agency share platforms. And so a couple of the most recent ones that we've worked on um, is having agencies adopt token transit as their digital fare payment. And so we've had several agencies that have adopted that. So if someone is going across the state, for example, or visiting another community, they'll already have the token transit app on their phone. So they won't have to download another app in order to pay the fares. We are also in the process of making transit app kind of our standard um, transportation app across the state. So several of the agencies are in that app also. And it's kind of for the same reason. We feel like it's important for people to really only have to know about one app for any kind of transportation in Kansas and transit is worldwide. So this one just made sense for us to do that. So like I mentioned, thank you, Florida. Um, you brought us Kansas Mobility Week. I had saw something that, about what you guys were doing down there and I said, hey, this sounds like a great thing. I wonder if we can do that in Kansas. So we started in um, November of 2021 with our first Mobility Week. We had 13 agencies hosting 17 events and we covered 10 counties. So we felt like that was pretty successful. We brought more mobility managers on and we agreed, yes, Mobility Week is something that we would like to continue. So we did round two in November of 22. And you can see the huge increase that we had. So we had 33 agencies, 54 events covering 37 counties. So more than a third of the state. And we had one statewide event. Um, I did have a meeting with a couple of Florida DOT representatives before we did that. Um, to let them know what we were doing. They loved the idea. They were happy that we were doing it. So um, we really built that communication between two states. We talk about Mobility Week in every kind of presentation that we do. Um, talked about it with Mississippi. We'll talk about it um, in Oklahoma. Talked about it in Denver at SWATA. We give credit to Florida and we're encouraging other states to take on Mobility Week as well. It's just a great way to gain information and share information about transit all across the state in one way. And you can see that we make sure that we have um, our same color scheme and the same branding that we share with everybody. We also had started Kansas Bike Month in 2022. So May is National Bike Month. Um, we're trying to increase multimodal opportunities, so this felt like a natural progression. We had nine events in five communities. And as you know, May is home to National Ride a Bike Day, National Bike to School Day, and National Bike to Work Day. Uh, and so our 2023 update for this month, we have 37 events happening in 16 communities. So there's a lot of biking 
going on across the state. A lot of groups, a lot of agencies are working around bikes. Uh, again, we kept our same branding and color scheme so that everything is easily identified. This week that you may know is National Transportation Week. Uh, it's usually the third week of May. So we also celebrate this week. We find any opportunity to have a party, really. Uh, so in 2022, we had 11 events in seven communities. This week, we have 15 events in eight communities with two statewide events. And those two statewide events, we kind of just made up. Um, really, that's what we do is kind of just make up things as we go. So two things that we kind of started this week. Uh, the first is got a story to tell. So it's a page on our Kansas Rides website where passengers can go share why transportation is important to them. Um, just gives us that data that we can use then to tell our stories to stakeholders, to county commissions, to whoever we need to, to show the importance of transportation coming from passengers' words, not just our words. And then the other thing um, is our mobility mention series. So this will be on Facebook. And we'll probably do this maybe monthly where we'll have something that one of the mobility managers recommends. So like I mentioned, Cassandra is very much into um, disability accommodations. And so she was talking about an app that she uses called Sociability. And so if you're going to someplace new, you can go in this app and it'll tell you about the accommodations, if it is, if it's not, things to look out for, different things like that. So we wanted to share information about that. She's a user, she uses it, she believes in it, and that started our mobility mention series. And just a little bit about the events that we have for both Kansas Mobility Week and National Transportation Week. We let the agencies decide what they wanna do for those things. Um, we tell them, you know, keep it simple, keep it easy. It's whatever you guys wanna do. And then we just work with them to, to do the promotion side of it and have everything all in one place. We had a super busy year in 2022. As you can see, we started a lot of different things. Um, another group that we started was called the Moving Kansas Network. And so as their mobility managers were meeting, we were talking about how great it would be to have a monthly time when agencies could come together, share information, talk to each other, learn about things that we're all interested in that we don't have time necessarily to do on our own, and the mobility managers would kind of facilitate this group. So we started this in July of last year. Um, our very first, our second meeting was this field trip. So we all got together, we drove to Lawrence, and we looked at their brand new electric vehicles. Um, so it was a great way for us to see each other in person, which we hadn't done in quite a while. We were able to ask questions, um, look at these vehicles. We took a little bus ride through town, and then it's just kind of grown from there. So we have a monthly meeting, and right now we've got six mobility managers, KDOT, uh, KURTAP is included in this and then seven of the largest transit agencies in the state. And so we just hold these monthly meetings. Sometimes we just talk. We have each agency share about different things that they have going on. Uh, sometimes we have speakers come in. So we've had transit app come in and talk. We've had spare come in and talk. Um, and by come in and talk, I mean through our Zoom webinars. Uh, we've done this field trip. We met in person last August at our state conference. And so we're just always looking for ways to share information, to learn from each other. And it has really increased communication. Before mobility managers came on, and even in probably the first couple of years where I was on the team, everybody was very siloed, was very much individual. This is what I do. I don't really need to talk to anyone else about it. And we have really changed that narrative in the past at least 12 months, maybe a little bit more than that. So where people can reach out to each other, 
um, talk, share, because we realize that everyone is on the same page, we're on the same team, we have the same goals, so how can we help each other make our daily jobs a little bit easier? Um, when we initially started this, we, we did a little survey of the group and there were three main areas that everyone wanted to focus on. And so we've kind of been working off of this list. One was modern transit. So electric vehicles, of course, fall under that. Microtransit is also a big topic. A couple of agencies are getting started in that and we're you know, learning from each other because a couple more want to start as well. Software and technology, of course, is always important and then funding sources. I mean, you can't really say enough about that and trying to find local match, working with FTA, uh, finding additional grants, things like that. I also mentioned KCART, which start, stands for Kansas Coalition for Accessible Regional Transportation. And it right now is starting out small as a two county coalition and there's two main goals from this. So the first one is hospital engagement, working with um, at least one, if not two primary hospitals in this metropolitan area, sharing information about transportation, finding out what their needs are, you know, just increasing communication between the hospital, the medical system and the transportation agencies. Uh, and then also talking about funding. So we all know how many funding sources are out there and available, working on compiling kind of a, a spreadsheet of those of those resources. Um, how do you apply for them? Which ones can be braided together? Sharing all of that information together. And this was a result of a grant that Mike Spadafore in Topeka, a mobility manager applied for. He brought all of us together. Um, and then we've been working on creating a plan coming out of this. And then the ultimate goal would then be to have this replicated across the entire state. So sharing a hospital engagement plan, this is kind of the, the framework for how you would do that, whether that's in Salina where I'm at, if that's in Hayes in Western Kansas, providing that framework so then an agency can go and do hospital engagement with a set plan and, and be successful with it. And again, you can see consistent branding, even though it does have a different logo, a different name, it's a product of mobility manage management. So we've got the gold and the blue color scheme. Another, um, kind of, this was kind of a big deal. Uh, it was called our Kansas Tech Summit, it was a two day intensive workshop that was led by NCAT. KDOT applied for a grant to have them come in and host this uh, two-day workshop for us. We had about 50 participants uh, from different agencies across the state. There was KDOT, um, KURTAP, and the mobility managers all there. So we were in, in this room for two days. We brainstormed problem statements. It was so much good communication. Um, Everybody was kind of mixed up together, so you weren't with people that you necessarily knew, but you were able to talk through problems, come up with solutions, and then out of this came a key action statement that KDOT has released to all the agencies across the state with specific, very specific and very doable solutions to some of the problems that were identified at this tech summit. Um, so then there's also a timeline of kind of next actions and who's responsible for those next actions. And so it just felt to me like everyone was very much engaged. Um, there was really good communication and everybody was interested in what was going on and coming up with solutions to potential problems. So you can see that we have a, a lot of things going on. Um, it's been great to have a team of mobility managers so we can share what we're working on. We're each making improvements in the communities and counties that we live in. And so there's been a lot of talking, especially here in 2023, about food access, um, kind of lack of it, increasing food costs, the number of people needing 
financial assistance for food has been increasing. And so it's turned out that three of the six mobility managers are involved with food access in their local communities, doing different things, providing different information, but it's just another way that we can provide um, communication and kind of a bridge between public transportation and any other social service or community needs. And so we can, we can do a whole other presentation just talking about food access. And then of course we um, all do different conference presentations, both locally within our communities, uh, within our state, and then on the national level. So like I mentioned, uh, we were at Southwest Transit Association Conference in Denver in February. Um, we've had mobility managers at SUMSI, um, at the National Architect Conference. So we try to share information and we love learning from everyone. So I loved hearing about what they're doing in Missouri. Um, I love to hear about what you guys are doing in Florida. So it's just a great way to share with each other. Uh, one thing that we have done in the past, pre-COVID and hope to get back to in 2024 is Transit Day at the Capitol. So we, of course, go set up booths in Topeka and talk with legislators and other interested parties about transit, what's happening across the state and what needs are and different things like that. Uh, we also work with agencies if they want to celebrate National Transit Driver Appreciation Day. And then we've also participated in the Kansas Transit Rodeo, which we, of course, haven't had that in a couple of years either. And then just a little bit about how we communicate as a group. So like I mentioned, we have monthly meetings with the six of us. Um, Anjali attends those. Sometimes we bring in some other, other mobility managers from other areas or different people that have um, different things that we're interested in talking about. We usually share what current projects that we're working on, any updates, and we really, really communicate well with each other using this monthly meeting. We also have quarterly meetings where we meet in person, and we also meet with the six of us plus KU, RTAP, and representatives from KDOT. And again, it's just about updates and sharing and getting that connection between those three groups. Um, Slack has been really a game changer for us. It is a type of communication program it's really instant messaging. It's the separate program that we have. You can have it on your phone, um, on your desktop, on your laptop. I can send a message to everyone in a group. I can send an individual message. It's not clogging up my email. It's keeping things neat and organized. And we can share things that we maybe wouldn't share otherwise. I mean, you don't want to, you feel guilty sometimes about sending emails to a lot of different people. So it's really increased our communication immensely. And we've got right now, all of the mobility managers are on there. All of our Moving Kansas network partners are on there. We've got KDOT on there uh, and KURTAP. You do have to pay for Slack. It gets a little bit pricey the more people that you start to add to it, but it really has been a great resource for us. And then we also have a Google Drive where we have shared presentations, logos, Kind of all the stuff that we can get to whenever we need it. And I've thrown a lot of our partners' names out there. So of course we couldn't do what we do every day without Kansas Department of Transportation, KU RTAP program, our Kansas Public Transit Association holds an annual conference that we participate in. We now have a seat at the table in that group which is a change just this year. So that's been great for us to be recognized in that way. Like I mentioned, we've gotten grants from NADTC. We work with Easter Seals, the National Center for Mobility Management. So we're really thankful to have all of those partners with us to provide us information, provide us resources, provide us networking opportunities, opportunities like today for us to share and talk about the different things that we do. So I know this was a ton of information. Looks like there are a few questions, uh, but you guys can reach out to me at any time. Check out our website. You know, give us suggestions if you have them. Uh, we're we're happy to 
to network and talk. We did have um, the question about sharing the handbook, and I did let them know that we will share that if they had okay. any questions for them to develop their own handbook. Yep. And we do have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Angela. We do have a question from Heidi. How would you say farmer markets are included in the food access topic for mobility management? They are 100% included in that. Um, I'm really just getting started in the food access in my community. Uh, we're getting a group together to talk about how we can support all of those different things. I know Mike Wilson in Manhattan actually has a seat on their food council board. We don't have a food council board here yet. Um, and they definitely do support the food councils. Those are included. I know in Lawrence is the same as well. Dre works with the local food bank, did some mapping for them to provide them better locations for their mobile pantry. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways that we can support that work. And I wanted to say, if anyone's interested, um, we do have a food access mobility working group um, that I started last year with mobility managers and some of the university extensions and transit agencies and social service agencies, CDC, USDA, um, all sorts of groups. And we're putting together a documented toolkit. Michelle is um, heading up. Uh, two of those subcommittees. So um, please just shoot me an email. We can add you all on there. We do have um, uh, a Florida group that's on there as well. And um, it's really, really important. I started because we had a lot of mobility managers and that was an issue with um, they were facing was food access. And, and then agencies also were trying to use their vehicles to get food to people or get people to food. So um, it's really, really great. Um, thank you so much, Mich for Michelle, for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I did not see any other questions. Do you see other questions, Jonathan or Martin? No, not at this time, but uh, I encourage everybody, ask anything, ask away. There's a lot of good stuff being presented here and um, um, no question is stupid. There's There's a lot of different types of coordination and networking going on, so please, please ask anything if you're curious. I did drop the agenda in the chat. You may have noticed that it is our break time. So we have, we went over a little bit of time, but that is okay because we have a lot of, a lot of awesome information that's being given. So I hope that's okay. Uh, we have about six minutes left and we will reconvene at 11 o'clock. Okay, I think everybody is back. Hope everyone had a great kind of short break to stretch, grab some water, grab some coffee. We are going to start back and we are now at session four if you have your agenda pulled up. And we will start with the MSAT tool, which is Mobility Management Performance Measurement Tool. And that will be presented by Steve Workman with Transport New Hampshire, and he's also a consultant with NCMM through Easter Seals Transportation Group. Hey, Anjali, this is Michelle. Before we get into our oh. next presentation, I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention that oh, okay. it, it, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I, it doesn't appear that the chat box is working correctly. So um, it is a web. Go Sorry, ahead. it's a webinar. They'll have to drop it in the Q and A. Do you see that? I see that. So the chat box is definitely uh, disabled, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I think that that's uh, that's where the uh, um, that that's where we dropped the agenda. So I feel like people can't get to it. And it should have been sent out also on the last email the other day. Okay. Um, All right. Well, that's fine. I just can... wanted to make sure that I wasn't, you know, Let's there wasn't see. an issue. Me... There. But thank you. Let me change to see if I can change it. Okay. Can you, can everyone see if we'll let me change it now where attendees can chat? There we go. 
sometimes it'll let me reset it. I know we had some new permissions added here. All right. And we have people now chiming in, Laura Perks. There we go. Like, and there's Heidi, excellent. Yeah, normally when it does a webinar like setup, it does it, it'll disable the chat and we keep the Q&A. So sorry about that. Some people don't that, like You turn it on on the fly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Dr. Lee. No problem. Let me just close that up real quick here. So Steve uh, Workman will be um, presenting our performance manage measurement tools. Um, I just want to say that this is a tool that was developed with NCMM and Steve Workman of Transport New Hampshire. Um, it is a really, really great tool, especially um, a lot of the DOTs are adopting this tool to use as kind of an evaluation tool and also the mobility managers to assess and evaluate um, a lot of the programs that they are doing. So I hope that um, you guys will certainly find this tool useful. And this is just a micro version of it, <laughs> as Steve will tell you, and there'll have to be lots of follow-up. All right, thank you very much, Angelique. Can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, let's hope it stays that way. Well, greetings everyone from uh, the Arctic Circle or what's better known as Northern New England. I can't see uh, any of you, so I am assuming uh, that you are all sun-kissed and bronzed and, and enjoying warmth and sunshine. Meanwhile, up here, we're just trying to get into a really solid spring. I'm really happy to be with you today. Um, at this point, you should be able to see um, the slides on a screen. And I want to thank Angelique. She's going to be uh, running the slides for me. And she's also, even though we're spanning two sessions today, um, she's going to make sure I don't get carried away and keep me on, on task. So Angelique, as usual, when we present, feel free if you need to jump in with any added information. <laughs> so next slide, please. I want to tell you just a little bit uh, about myself in Transport, New Hampshire. So I'm actually an independent contractor. I live in Kittery, Maine, uh, which is right across the border from New Hampshire. Uh, and I serve as a contract director for Transport, New Hampshire. So essentially, Transport, New Hampshire is a statewide single person shop. And we're completely independent. I do not provide direct service. Um, but what I do is to work in the spaces in between. Um, that's an old community organizing uh, term is called the gappers. But it's basically those folks are trying to pull people together. And we've already had heard two great examples of this from uh, both Kelly and Michelle earlier in the presentation, um, how they went out and kept trying to pull people, pull people, pull. Uh, so I try to do that in New Hampshire. Um, I also am a convener and coordination instigator. I do mean instigator. Um, one of the things, because I don't do direct service and because I'm independent, is I can often talk about things that aren't necessarily being addressed or offer um, an opinion or some insight and then prod people. Um, and so I, I get to do that. And, and uh, often it works out well. Um, also, I do policy change and advocacy work. That's a that's a cornerstone of Transport New Hampshire. And then organizational support and strategic planning and innovation. And that's really how I came to you today. And that is because uh, in my time at Transport New Hampshire, I was able to facilitate the creation of a statewide mobility management network. Uh, we had to do about two and a half years of planning for this. Uh, lots of um, discussions. We had to have lots of input. We needed did everything from top down, so DOT all the way down to our providers and, of course, our stakeholders or our consumers. Um, this has been successful. We're in our implementation phase. And because we worked across centers, we were able to combine 5310 funding, some flexed state um, transportation block grant funds, and most importantly, the COVID disparity grant, which was given federally by the Senators, Centers for Disease Control, this was given to every state. But in New Hampshire, we set aside $3 million to actually get our mobility management uh, network up and running. So we now have eight regional mobility managers, which provide statewide coverage, and one statewide mobility manager. And all of those folks are approaching their one year anniversaries. They were all on board by the end of last summer. So we're still really new here, uh, but we're learning a lot. And hopefully I can share some of that insight and weave it into my presentation. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna take you on a, a little bit of a thought journey. Now, if 
you and I were in the room together, not seeing that click over yet. There we go. So I want you to imagine you were on an airplane. And if we were in a room together, I can assure you that I would probably have you take your belt and shoes off so that you could really get in the zone of going through a, uh, a TSA flight check, a pre-check. Uh, but we're going to just imagine. So imagine that you've purchased your ticket to wherever your de destination is. And then you get onto that plane. You're settled in. You've had a little speech. The things drop down. They showed you how to put it on. Save yourself first. And then suddenly the pilot comes on and he says, hello, folks. Welcome or she and then she says um so where do you want to go today now imagine in that moment you got on that plane after purchasing a ticket to a specific destination you want to go to your destination maybe it's hawaii the person behind you actually wants to come visit me in maine you can see where this is going there is complete and total chaos it breaks down this is why we need to have systems, and this is why the system has to work. So let's take that TSA piece, a joke that I made before. If TSA didn't exist, sure, we'd all we'd all probably be like, oh, thanks. But the reality is they help keep us safe. We need that system. The ticket agency, that has to be organized. Flights have to be networked together. The plane has to know where it's going. You can't have a decision in midair. And so the reason I took you through this is because the MSAT, uh, as we'll talk about earlier, is, is a tool to help you do a deep dive on all of your system. So next slide, please. So really, if we go back to the airplane example, mobility management is all about coordination. That plane can only be effective if all the different parts of that system, of the flight system, coordinates. Our job as mobility managers is this coordination. I like to use these graphics in front of the screen here. So the first one is an example of without mobility management. You can see a big box. So think of that as the, the environment in which we're working. Think of that as the highest levels of policy and direction. And you can see it's going in a bunch of different directions. Now, inside that, there are little dark um, solid arrows represent stakeholders out there. That's providers, that's maybe somebody in the health side, that could be your consumers, and they all have a mission and a need. But notice they're all going in different directions. Know that this is going to miss resources, it's going to miss opportunities, and we certainly aren't going to get to a place of collaboration and sharing resources. Now, if we apply the principles of mobility management, look at the, the next slide. Suddenly, the large arrow is unified because we've organized, we've created a plan, we've operationalized it and got the buy-in of all those solid individuals in the center. And we are now all moving in the same direction. This is where you are gonna get the most bang for your buck. This does not happen magically. And just as you heard uh, the process, Kelly talked a lot about her process and then Michelle followed up with what they've done in uh, Kansas, but it's not a one-off thing. You have to nurture, you have to keep these relationships strong, you have to keep reaffirming your planning and you have to continuously evaluate. Next slide, please. So something I've been thinking about, um, and I, I finally put on paper, you know, mobility management is three things to me simultaneously. I believe it's a theory and approach to delivering mobility services. Now stop there for a second. If that is true, then we do not care what mode because all modes are valuable. So this also means just as we're talking about breaking down barriers between sectors of government, we need to make sure that we are not creating or maintaining barriers within our transportation uh, modes. And a lot of times that happens. Mobility managers go into the breach and try to pull folks together and realize that actually this concept of putting the user, the consumer at the center is the approach that can unify everything we're trying to do. So next, it's an operational model because it's great to have a theory, but you have to figure out how to implement that. You have to bring folks to the table. And then lastly, we know that it's a profession and a mobility manager is a skilled 
technician that is doing well first you're wearing a million hats and you are spinning plates let's be honest um if you don't feel that way in your job i i, I respectfully suggest that you're you might be missing something uh because this is hard work it's a lot going on <clears throat> next slide please <laughs> well so no small task how do we keep mobility management sustainable and thriving so like pulling a rabbit out of a hat in other words magic okay i like magic i'm a big harry potter fan but that's not going to do it folks we need to get down to brass tacks and we need to develop tools that can allow us to do that because it's got to be based on something more than wishful thinking next slide please So let's pause for a second because I've been tossing around sustainability for a long time. So this is a this is a check in. In this day and age, we have been dealing with issues of climate change um, being discussed for roughly I think thirty years easily. Because of that, when you say sustainability, a lot of folks immediately default default to thinking about the environment. And what I want to do is back us up and say, yes, that's absolutely true. We do use it that way. But actually, if we take the, the actual definition of sustainability, it's as follows. The ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. And isn't that what we're talking about today? And then the second one is interesting. Avoidance of depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. OK, there's the nod to environmentalism. But actually, just just stop that for a second and think about what happens if you deplete your resources your system will begin to collapse so sustainability is the lens that we used for the msat but what you're going to find as we move into it the msat is much more than that but it it tells you right up front, this tool is to help you walk through every aspect of your operation so that you can generate data, you can find where your strengths are, and you can find where your weaknesses are, and you can employ resources and strategic data to improve those places. That will keep you sustained. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so on my end, the slide isn't changing. So there we go. So, uh, so what is this MSAT? So first off, um, it is a mobility management sustainability assessment tool. There's another word you could put in there. You could swap out sustainability for self-assessment because this is really what's happening. But we wanted to, again, showcase the lens of sustainability. So this is really what it does. So it's an assessment tool to help mobility management professionals measure the overall sustainability of their programs, identify the different dimensions of sustainability, Focus efforts to increase your sustainability, and then most importantly, make data-driven strategic decisions. We toss performance measures around all the time. But from what I've seen in New Hampshire and nationally, we have not yet quite cracked that nut. Um, we have a lot of existing performance measures that I consider to be very mechanical, trip miles, cost per trip. Um, length of trip, did trips, all of those things, there's a mechanical aspect to them. And what I would like to challenge our field is to think about measuring what matters. Sure, we need those mechanical type measures. So no one's going to, they're not going to go away because they have value. But what we need to do is start looking at where is the impact? Where is the real impact to the people we serve because they are at the heart of mobility management. So if you start to look at these things, if you start to collect data that's more meaningful, and, and I forget, but I think it was Kelly's presentation where she showed how they did a lot of data and they started to overlay that data. And it started to paint a picture and it directed them where they needed resources, where they had needed to have more conversations. That's how we get to measuring what matters. Next slide, please. So the benefits of using the MSAT, stay in the know. Now I will tell you, I have just recently added this first bullet to this slide. So it is, it is true that what you don't know could negatively impact you. 
In other words, if you are not constantly scanning your environment and operations, you cannot assess the overall health and sustainability. So it is what you don't know and cause harm to your organization. So this answers the question, why is this part of my job? Why do I have to know about advocacy? Why do I have to know about how we fund things? I, I'm, I'm trying to connect people with rides, and that's very much true. What I am respectfully suggesting is what you don't know could negatively impact what you're trying to do. Next, it helps us with sustainability planning. So increasing the government and charitable funding resources are looking for evidence that your organization is thinking about and planning for long-term sustainability. We know this. FTA has been making some significant changes under CCAM, which Danielle will talk about later today. Those changes um, require us to take some action. It also requires us to send better data back to them so that collectively we can learn and adjust to the benefit of the field. Relationship building and buy-in is another reason. So theoretically, a single person could complete the MSAT uh, and find value. But the real value in the MSAT is not the score. You'll see what the score means in a, in a bit. It's actually the process of bringing people together to discuss who will be proved to be more effective. And they'll think of this process as an opportunity to, to hear different perspectives, build relationships, and create buy-in. So it is the process where the highest value lays in the MSAT. Next is data-driven strategies. Um, so the old adage that doing the same thing produces the same results is quickly forwarded when you start to analyze and data and identify strengths to build on in areas that require change. So it's also easier to engage people in policy change and funding needs when the data justifies the request. Here in New Hampshire, we've started talking um, a little bit differently. I told you that advocacy is a big piece. So right now, um, I have been working with some of our key leaders to advance a significant increase in transit matching funds. Our state currently has put up $200,000 annually, which places us at the bottom of the barrel for public transit. What we did was we stopped going to the legislature with an empty hand. It's the Oliver Twist, please, sir, I'd like some more. And we said, no, wait a minute. We have value. We are providing valuable services. And not only that, we are innovating to increase that value. We are finding ways to share resources, to braid funding. And our policymakers needed to know that. But you see, we came with something and said, we're already doing this. Our eyes are already on lack of housing, getting people to jobs, food insecurity. Here's how we fit into the solution. But we need your support through funding and, and supportive policies. And then the last is expanding capacity in the field of mobility management. Let's face it, we are on the front line of developing mobility management. Uh, you've heard examples today of fantastic things. And I realize that each state and professionals are at different levels in their developments around the system. But here in New Hampshire, we keep saying that we're, I'm going to go back to the plane. We keep saying that we're, we're building the plane while we're flying it. And to a certain extent, that is true, I believe, for all of us. because. The need isn't going away. We can't simply go on retreat for a couple of years, figure this out while people are in desperate needs of rides. So therefore, we are expanding. We are the front lines. We are the thought leaders that are trying to strengthen our field and be more effective for the people we serve. Next slide, please. So I want to make a connection to you. So this is this is under the heading of why would I possibly take the time to do the MSAT, not once, but on a regular basis, which may, may be annually for you, maybe it's every two years, whatever fits. Well, there are a lot of ways that this can plug in. So first off, you know that you have to report on a certain number of performance measures. Now, the MSAT is not going to spit out performance measure data, but what it does is it uses that, as I said previously. But it also intersects really well with other tools that may be already in use in your state, or perhaps it's a requirement that you have to do and you could start linking or start using it. So on screen, I'm just showing you one of many examples. So a logic model. So in working on MSAT, I've, I've done a, a lot of work with uh, Minnesota, who is using the M MSAT. They're at the beginning process. But Minnesota did a huge investment in time in developing a logic model for their mobility management program. And that started right at the, the top with DOT. 
And what we started seeing was when we had when we get to look at this this great plan they put together, we saw how the MSAT could come and it would do this. And so I want to suggest to you that there are tools out there that can focus your work, that can talk about what the outcomes are, i.e., performance measures, and the MSAT can help to inform that. And the data you get out of something like a logic model can help to inform the responses to the MSAT. Other things that I'm, I don't have an example for is think of your coordination plans. Think of your state management plans, all those things that FTA require for those funding sources. The data and the discussions that come out of MSAT can be used to inform those plans. So you're not always, oh gosh, we have to file our plan in another six months it's due and then we can forget about it for the next three years or five years. You can pull data and you can keep that. You are aware because you've kept your eye on the ball right away. And if you have to take something you've learned in MSAT, you can drop that into those type of plans. And remember, if it is not in a plan, it does not exist, not in the world of government. Next slide, please. So really, I like to think of this as an intersection. And what is the return on investment? So I will be honest with you. If you decide to adopt the MSAT, it will require resources of time and potentially some money. We'll talk about, about why. Um, but it's, it is an investment. So the first question anybody has to say is, what, why? What's the return on it? I hope that you've seen some value already with what I've discussed, but I do think there are these four points to reiterate. It helps you with your planning. It helps you with implementation. It helps you with evaluation. And it helps you with sustainability. If there isn't value under those four bullets, um, I think I'm out of a job. <laughs> so... Let's go uh, next slide and let's move forward saying, yeah, there's value in those things. Oh, great. So what is the MSAT? What is this tool? So here's what we did. The MSAT did not just, uh, we didn't just throw a bunch of things at the, at the board. We actually started with research and this is the beauty of FTA being on board in our, in our technical assistance programs at FTA funds, because we were able to engage federal highway um, some C participated, of course, NCMM and a host of other folks. But initially, we started with that conversation. And the MSAT actually came from something that Federal Highway is already employing. Um, Federal Highway uses something like this to have their states think about all the operations that go on under Federal Highway. So here in New England, that includes snow plowing operations. So what they've done is they've taken this. <laughs> they've taken this and then they have said, okay, uh, this will help you evaluate what you're doing and make changes. So when we went to them and said, we think there's some value here and this might translate, they were super excited. Now their model actually comes out of Silicon Valley. It was a process that was used out in software companies. So we looked at it and we realized, okay, this could work. And then the second thing that we did was um, by this point, uh, through my work in, in New Hampshire, um, DHHS and that CDC partnership, that allowed me to work very closely with a colleague at DHHS uh, to make connections to health. And so there is a model in use by the um, national health organizations called SOAR. And it's essentially a similar self-evaluation tool that is used to guide them through the work they're doing to find where it's successful and where they need to implement more resources. Well, suddenly we're realizing we may use slightly different language, but we're all getting at the same thing. So we feel like this MSAT has some strong underpinning or strong value underneath it because of those that came before us that developed tools and we were able to borrow from that. So for the purposes of our tool, we ultimately reduced down to five dimensions. And so those dimensions are organizational infrastructure. This is things literally your organization, uh, everything from HR to employment policies, uh, re recruitment, uh, retention, you name it. Anything that happens to keep an operation going is under dimension one. Next is collaboration and coordination. We know that is the heart and soul of mobility management. So you explore how that is happening. Next, of course, service delivery, because that is the reason that we're doing any of this, getting people rides. So we look at those operations as well. 
that's dimension three. Dimension four is evaluation and continuous improvement system. This is where if you look at the tool, you're going to do a drill down and you're going to see it speaks to your performance measures. What are you collecting? How are you collecting it? Are you using something like a logic model? How does it come together? And if you find that you are not exactly where you want to be under that category, then you realize we're going to put some effort in there. And this is timely because, as we know, the requirement for reporting better data is increasing. And then the last one is environmental impact. So here we are, we've added the environment back in. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, and first off, I want to acknowledge that as mobility managers, you might be listening to saying, hey, Steve, you got this wrong. I have nothing to do. I, this is so out of my control. I can't contribute to the environmental impact. And I would respectfully push back on that. And I'd say that may be true, but you actually are looking at your environment. You see where opportunities are. So when we're talking about no low buses, greening your fleet, um, when we're talking about new facility construction, things like that, um, you can have an eye on that and you can provide that type of input. If your organization has bought into this and the leadership change and says, you know what, we do actually wanna hear your perspective on this. That's that process of coming together for MSAP. Then suddenly you do have something meaningful to say. I understand that you will probably not be the one to carry out some of those changes, but it's relevant. The other thing I want to say to you is that when we were reviewing this again with Federal Highway, FTA, all those folks, and, and we said this, you know, we said we really think because the FTA funding requirements are moving us in this direction. So we have to be doing some work on these issues. So it really makes sense that the tool is going to reflect some requirements we're having at a higher level. Next slide, please. Well, here's, a, here's some small text for you to strain at, but this is an actual snapshot of the MSAT itself. So this is cool. So um, the complete tool, but I'm gonna walk you through it so that you can see it. So first off on the left-hand column, the tiny one, that just lists the dimensions. So dimension one, organizational infrastructure, there it is. Now, if you go over to the middle column that says focus, you'll see, what do we mean by that? So it's a descriptor of the overall dimension. What we found was that's not enough. As we started to test this in the field, folks were like, whoa, wait a minute, you're kind of getting swimmy, especially if this is not something that you are responsible for in your day to day. And suddenly they're like, I, I'm not even sure what that means. So we said, we have to make this a little more accessible. So this is where we created sub dimensions. And as you can see, those are the, those are the white um, lines and they're numbered 1A, 1C, 1D because they're all sub dimensions of organizational infrastructure. So we ask you to focus in on governance and we describe what that looks like. And those descriptions, those focus, those are supposed to provide you, they're, they're sort of like leading questions. How can you self-direct your group discussion around this? Answer those aspects that we've highlighted for you. Then as we go further, we go into human resources and workforce. Uh, let's face it, um, I don't believe you all are any different than up here in New England. We are all scrambling to hire enough people, drivers in particular. So retaining, recruiting and retaining our workforce is a hot button issue right now. Well, you could have the best advertisement. You could have the best... Um, an attraction to get folks in. But if your policies don't keep those people engaged and happy, then you have a retention problem. And it's going to be that sort of revolving door. So we want you to look closely at that. And then funding. And again, we explain that funding, we all understand, and we're often finding funding to do mobility management in addition to providing the services. So we look at how you do that. Um, I'm not going to talk about two because the tool just goes on and that's that same pattern. But let's go all the way to the right side of the screen. So on that side, you can see emerging capacity, moderate capacity, and high capacity. We struggled with a scoring system because the reality is the score doesn't matter. It's simply a tool. The other thing is I want to make clear from the outset. This is not a new requirement. FTA is not secretly waiting to say, okay, everybody, you must use this. They are highly interested in you adopting it. They're encouraging you to use it because they think it's a useful tool to help you in the field. But 
these scores, the feedback you get isn't designed to penalize you. It's not going to be a requirement in order for you to get grant funding. So you can see how the score becomes less, less of an issue, but let's face it, it's sometimes helpful to bring a point. So at the end of our discussion on a particular sub uh, subdivision, the group is going to reflect on everything that was just said and, and, and think, you know, where, do, where does that put our, our capacity? Are we emerging? Well, a word about emerging, that doesn't actually mean that you're not doing your job well, because a lot of us are starting in different places. So for you, emerging capacity might be the absolute best thing that you could do at this point in time. Now, a system that has been around longer and perhaps better resourced, they may find that they're in moderate to high capacity. And that's fine because they're only evaluating themselves against themselves. So that is the takeaway from this. Please do not see this as punitive. We all went through school and we all probably have a little bit of trauma about a lot of red ink and a low grade. That is not what the MSAT is doing for you. It is an honest look at your capacity and helping encourage you. Do you think, rhetorical question, because I can't see you, but do you think going through the MSAT and let's say uh, you rate yourself maybe six subdimensions. You say, you know what? We really are high capacity. Do you Thank believe you show with that thumbs up? <laughs> yeah, right. Do you believe that we should take all of the resources and say, let's just keep dumping into that high capacity? Meanwhile, you've identified maybe two or three with emerging capacity. So you see logically there, we say, you know what? Let's maintain what we're doing well. Now let's take a pause and go back and put some resources and effort behind those areas that are emerging. And slowly things will move over time. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. And we'll have to lead into um, the breakout groups in a couple of minutes, Steve. That's perfect, because I think we're getting close to that on the slides. Okay, so I, I actually just went into my whole speech about the, the scoring mechanism. So right, what you see right now is um, the verbiage we use to explain what those different capacities are. Um, I will let you read that on your own. It's in our mobility management um, implementation guide, which is available on the NCMM website. Uh, and you can sort of understand how that gets implemented. So next slide, please. So the MSAT, the process, um, I have to tell you, I am a process guy. And I know for some of you, you say, oh, gosh, is he going to get touchy feely on us? Do we have to sing Kumaya? No, that's not what I believe process is. Process is we need to come together and we need to talk. We need to figure this out. I believe that the expertise are in the room to solve problems most of the time. And if they're not, I bet most of you know which direction to start looking. So we need to tap the experience of your people, the knowledge they have learned by doing the job, the boots on the ground. In order for that to come out, we need to think about good process because that does not happen. Um, and honestly, I do think that on the government side of things and even within our transportation world, I think process or the human side um, of this work, and let's face it, we're providing rides to other humans delivered by humans. So the human dynamic is very much a part of the work we do. So I wanna suggest the good process looks like this. It's not the enemy ensures that everyone has an opportunity to participate, be heard and respected while moving the group toward consensus, builds on a common vision, shared ideals and strengths or assets, and does not shrink away from hot spots, but tries to work through them. A lot of us do the hands off when we get near the third rail. The problem with that is that makes a stuck point and who ultimately is impacted by that probably the people that we're trying to serve. So we have to go in bravely into those hot spots and respectively and figure out how to work through them. So good process requires good facilitation. So when I said um, there may be some cost to the MSAT, it isn't, it isn't for us. The cost is doing that in person is more effective. You can have eye to eye in the same room. You can have a deeper discussion. It's going to work more effectively. The other thing is to have a skilled facilitator that understands the MSAT initially. I believe that once 
a, a group has gone through the MSAT, there will be folks who can then carry that forward as facilitators in their state. But meanwhile, we're trying to suggest find that facilitation because it will help you through this process. A safe space to speak honestly and openly about the challenges and opportunities. This is so incredibly important, and that tone must be set by the highest level of leadership. So DOTs, I'm looking at you, because I have heard from the field while we were developing this some real fear that if they speak honestly during this process, there may be retribution. And that's unfortunate. And I don't believe there is anybody that wants to see something like that happen. So it's really important, DOT, to speak to your folks and tell them, no, you want an honest evaluation. You want to hear what they have to say. It doesn't mean that you're on the line to do exactly what everybody says. But I think positioning yourself with open ears is really helpful. You need to establish ground rules. A clear understanding of the work before the group and strive for good communication between all stakeholders. And then, of course, there's always other requirements um, that many of you probably have little tools and techniques to, to create better conversations. If you take this part of it seriously, then I believe your MSAT experience is going to be more positive and also more fruitful. Next slide, please. Okay, so Anjali, we are now at a point where we can start to break out um, and we have two, two options that we can work with. Um, we can take that Dimension 5 environment and do some, uh, put the MSAT into action. Um, we can also take more questions, um, but I will, I will give, turn that over to you to lead us into the next phase of that process. Um, yes, let me leave it there for now. Okay, <clears throat> we, let's look at questions first. I know that's a lot. Okay. Yes, while we're um, while we're looking at questions on that a lot, um, we've done some uh, some good work with our friends in Mississippi on this, and they're working through the MSAT. And I remember we were in the room, and uh, two things happened. At one point, they said, "Steve, you're in the South now. Slow down." <laughs> but the other thing was, "Wow, this is dense." That is absolutely true. I want to alleviate your feel, your, your fear of something like that. I believe that you are more than capable of wrapping your head around this, but you need to have it in bite-sized pieces. You need someone to help you bring you through this. So if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed with this tool, please take a breath because I think you can implement it in a way that doesn't feel so crazy and allows you to start to move toward probably the full use of the MSAT, where you really do dig deep on all the issues, not just a few that you might select. Let's see. And I wanted to give the option um, to Michelle, if you, because of our time limit, and sometimes it's happening, if we wanted just to go over the tool as a whole and do two of the scenarios and ask people ask questions or go ahead and try to throw people, I think it may be easier that way. And then when we do a follow up, we can do it. Would that be easier? Yeah, and Anjali, I'll totally take your um your advice on that. If you okay. feel like it's easier, yeah, that's totally. I think we can just continue fine. just because, but it, but that was the condensed version of the presentation, and maybe just to keep going that way. So we'll just bring up the components, and everyone can do it together. Still, either way is fine. And that's a little okay. bit of a change, but thank you, uh, Steve. I'll bring this back up. Okay. And then we can pull those two pieces up. Okay. So let, okay. So let's look um, at dimension five. Now, this is going to feel very weird because we are out in um, floating around somewhere in the internet. Um, some of you may be in a room together. But this is just a taste of it. And I picked Dimension 5 because I think, again, as I talked about, your connection to the environmental piece may be a little more distant. It feels a little easier to do a sort of a quick and dirty experience. So the first thing that uh, we would do is we would actually read what Dimension 5 uh, means. And I am going to do that, uh, just in case you can't see that well. This dimension examines the positive and negative impacts operation of your organization has on the environment, 
and the strategies being used to promote positive and reduce negative impacts. It is understood that a mobility management network may have little direct control over environmental impacts because you operate out of a facility under another's control or umbrella under a lead agency, or perhaps do not operate your own fleet. If this is true, you should evaluate the ways in which you can promote influence environmental stewardship. This may include an environmental impact and value statements for your organization, steps being taken to reduce carbon emissions from your fleet, collaboration with local environmental efforts to promote public transportation, safe walking and biking as ways to reduce greenhouse gases. The emphasis of this dimension is to underscore that there are steps that can be taken appropriate to your level to reduce environmental impacts and align with new federal IIJA environmental policies. So that's what we mean by this dimension. Notice there's a customization in this. It says, respond from where you are at. Now, in the examples we heard earlier this morning in the different states, we heard about the promotion of biking and walking and public transit. Uh, we, have you made that connection that while you're trying to get people aware of the rides or the op mobility options and to use them, there is a direct environmental impact. So here's one example of you are doing env environmental work. It just happens to be a dual purpose. So what would this look like? So let's talk about um, a group. The MSAT was designed broadly to be used either as a state perspective, a regional perspective, or you could do it in your organization. I'm sure many of you out there, uh, if I asked, or you can even do thumbs up, are familiar with the SWAT exercise, or some people call it SWAC. So it's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats or challenges. So this is a, a very basic tool that is typically used before creating a strategic plan. But what happens is to do the SWAT, you start with a blank sheet of paper. What we did with the MSAT was we basically, it is an element of SWAT, but instead of leaving it loose, we, we made it specific by giving you these definitions and dimensions to lead you through the process. But you're still analyzing that sort of piece, that, that thought process that you go through if you've ever taken the SWAT exercise. So let's, um, so next I would say to you, okay, doing it internally works well. What about regionally or statewide? That does get a little more complicated because you can only respond to your direct experience. So that may only be your organization. That may only be your region that you're responsible for or working in. So you want to take steps to figure out either how that comes together as a whole. So in other words, you offer some opinions as you go through, and that's collected as part of the whole. And we don't actually direct it at any one organization. It's this conversation showed us these are some problem spots throughout the state or throughout whatever region we've been measuring. So I suggest that right now because we're in a large group and you're all mixed. So if we were in the room trying to do this, you would quickly realize like, oh my gosh, I'm talking about this and this person's talking about this over here. That's okay. There's still value. So let's um, do this right now. So the first sub dimension is policy and analysis. So what you would ask yourself is what are the policies we currently have in place that actually support a positive impact or reducing negative impacts on environment on the environment itself literally the the earth our climate so i want to give you and angeli this is again this is always tricky when we're doing these virtual things so i'd invite you to jump in at this point as well but again because i don't have direct access to you what i would like to do is give you a moment to actually write some things i believe the chat is working now so I would like you to maybe drop in just a few very quick thoughts from your perspective working where you're at about the, the policies that may or may not be in place um, to support Dimension 5. And I'll give you about, uh, about a minute to do that. Yes, if you would drop in the chat and Jonathan and Mark, if you can see the chat so I don't have to pull it up and block the presentation. Sure thing.
Now, in the interest of not having a weird dead air time, I'm going to move us a little more quickly through this. Go ahead. <laughs> I so don't let's see go on. anything in the chat yet. Yeah, so I, I'm hoping regular participants have a, have a chance to do that. But I, I realize you are getting hit with a wall of information and no time. <laughs> to reflect. So believe me, I do understand that. We're just trying to give you a little bit of a taste of what you would do. So let's go on to 5B. And at any point, if you have a thought on any of these subdimensions, just drop it in the chat. So 5B is about the reduction of fleet carbon emissions. So as you're sitting there, what we would ask you to reflect on is, okay, first and foremost, are you part of managing a fleet? If you are, then you probably have more direct experience. But this is where you start to think of, well, what's happening with the people that own the fleets? Is there an effort underway to purchase low no emission buses, electric vehicles? Propane is another option that's out there that's considered cleaner to reduce those emissions. So is that happening? Is there charging infrastructure? in your facilities, because that is a huge stumbling block. It's all great to have money to buy an electric bus, but if you don't have the right power source capacity at your facility, you're not charging that bus. So you wanna consider about that. You also wanna think about um, where are some improvements in the fleet? Does an electric or a low no vehicle, do they actually provide a better ride? Is it smoother? Is it quieter? Those are all value adds for your customers who are riding. And then let's talk about facility modification, 5C. So again, you may not have any control over a facility and we all know that creating a new facility is very expensive. We're fortunate that we've seen an increase in that funding stream through the IIJA, but it's still very costly. So what is happening for facility modification? Who's got their eye on potential funding? Have you included your state department of energy or whatever you may call it? Because in terms of on the ground infrastructure in your state, I would imagine they very much need to be involved. This isn't just a DOT thing or just a mobility manager thing. Um, now think about facility modification in a whole different direction. Does your facility encourage its employees to bike to work, for example? I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of hopping on my bike and riding to my office only to be really a sweaty mess. <laughs> so in that case, you start to think, well, geez, has, does this facility have a place where I can change, perhaps even shower? Those things do exist out there. So think about your workforce. Think about how the facility deals with um you know, toxic materials or think, think about oil and, and fuel or anything that might be there. How is that handled? Are there opportunities to do that in a more environmentally friendly way? Those are the type of questions that you want to ask. If you don't know the answer to these questions as a group, you already have learned something. It tells you that this is an area that really there has a lot of focus on. So if you're thinking about your capacity, I would imagine you would mark emerging capacity. It means you're starting to think of it, but maybe you haven't even gone past the thought yet. That's actually okay, is you have learned something. The MSAT is not about you having all the answers. It's about getting as much, many answers and perspectives on the table and then realizing where the knowledge gaps are. So I'm looking in the chat. We have uh, Sarah talked about reduced trip ordinance and local government will allow better efficiency for fleets with additional ridership and additional funding for efficient vehicles. Excellent, spot on. Uh, Heidi, uh, simply better mileage vehicles. Excellent point. Um, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands or put a thumbs up, but how many of you have a... Uh, have a vehicle in your fleet that let's just say is probably past its useful life expectancy. Is that an efficient vehicle? Uh, I would wager to say no, probably not. So that's a, that's a great point. You don't always have to go straight to, wow, we need all electric right now. Um, also, uh, Jonathan, thank you. You just dropped the, the MSAT information brief. Um, a word about that. 
there is a second information brief that you can also find on the site. So the first one is the, the MSAT implementation guide. But over this past year, we continue to refine and implement the MSAT. And so there is another report of lessons learned from the field. And actually, uh, what, it, what it was in large part was I was distilling what Angeli, myself, Judy Shanley heard in working out in the field about the MSAT experience. But I also took my experience in New Hampshire and other things. And a lot of what's in there is food for thought that I think transcends mobility management. Um, so I would encourage you to look at both of them because you actually, um, you may find both very helpful. Okay, so I believe that we have, um, we, we've exhausted the people that had something to, to contribute right, right away on this topic. So again, this was not a robust discussion because we are all in different places. We all understand that. This was also your first time seeing this and being asked to do anything with that. And I also picked a topic that you may know the least about of all five dimensions. So that's okay. That was intentional to move us through this. It just was a simple taste of it. I would expect if you are gathering in a group to do this, this discussion would have elements of what I tried to talk about, but would become more robust. And now a word of caution. Most of us want to go from talking about a problem directly to problem solving. The MSAT does not provide solutions. It is an evaluation tool. So this means you need restraint because most groups that have piloted this for us have wanted to take the discussion right into how to fix it. So you have to have some, some uh, ability to keep that out of the conversation and say, no, that's the next step. We do that after so that you can keep asking the important questions, find those gaps. Anybody have specific questions about this? Again, I realize this is literally a taste. So I, I'm imagining you're thinking, yeah, I still don't quite get it, Steve. But does anybody have any questions at this juncture about how you would use the tool, um, how these discussions might go, other logistical pieces? And while we're giving Steve. folks a go ahead. Hey, Steve, it's uh, Jonathan. I uh, from Cutter, I, I I think I would just weigh in with the um, the implementation guide I, I just posted in the chat and and if you start to look at this, um, we we don't have time today to go over all of it and and all of its context, but um, there's tables and tables of really helpful information that you can start to look at as you formulate mobility management programs and and basically different parts of your organization and where you are. And um, just start taking a look at that, you know, after this session today, and, and we'll be able to follow up with you um, on any questions you have with that. And, and as you start to formulate programs, at the end of the day, real simply, it's, it's super detailed, but it's exactly what I think you would want to manage a new program, maybe even some existing programs and would probably help you greatly with, with grant funding and um, uh, seeking grant funding, even managing some of your current funding. So um, Anjali always said this, this, this topic is actually a full day of training and we put it into an hour. I think Steve's done a great job, but I would just say this is a start and it's okay for everybody that this is a great start to, to this topic and this very helpful tool. So, um, uh, hope you can look at this uh, implementation guide and the uh, supportive documents uh, soon. Thanks. Jonathan, thank you. Um, I, I want to take you around when I'm asked to speak on this now because you just succinctly highlighted a bunch of things. I really appreciate that. So, Anjali, um, uh, I'm going to leave it to you and, and time as to whether you wanted to do that other last activity or whether we feel like we've come to a good place. And of course, people's stomachs are probably starting to grumble. <laughs> we are at a place now, we have about two minutes before um, everyone is going to be going to lunch. So I think we will pause there. Um, I want to check just to see if there's any other questions um, that may be still popping up in the chat here. 
or on the Q&A here. We have a quiet group today, but please, as you think about it over lunch, um, feel free to ask. There is one question, Angelia and Steve, about uh, can the tool help develop form, help you develop performance measures as an organization? I do believe that it can inform. Um, dimension four is, is the performance measure dimension. So what that does is that tries to get you to look at your existing system and find deficiencies and actually collecting data, or perhaps you collect the data and it's, it's kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls. It just gathers dust and no one ever looks at it. So the MSAT will help you talk through issues of performance measures from collection um, to what you're measuring to how you're using it strategically. And then it's up to you to, to take the next steps to figure out how you would actually improve that if you find that you're, you feel you're deficient in some way. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, we will break for lunch and we have an hour for lunch, I believe. Is that correct, guys? Yes, want to make sure. And I'll leave this up so all you have to do is log, is just come right back to your computer so you don't have to log out and log back in. So lunch will be from 12 to 1. And then we come back, we will have Danielle Nelson with U.S. Department of Transportation, FTA. Great. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the time. I look for. I will be at CTA with Angelie, so I look forward to meeting you if you're there. Um, I learn a ton of all of you, so you make my job uh, much more rich and better. So I hope someday we can connect more deeply. Thank you. Thank you.